Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 188. So glad you could join me. Today's guest, Dick Westheimer, will be here in about 10 minutes or so. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this. We love poetry, and I know you do too, so please do click the like button and share. Make sure you're subscribed. Ring the bell for notifications. Leave reviews on iTunes and Spotify. Anything you can do to help poetry spread around the internet would be greatly appreciated. Um, We always like to start out with the news poets we had for the week. And um, today we're... Don't have Abby Murray. She's a bit under the weather, but she has this wonderful poem that she shared with us for um, Sunday. Um, And it's one of those things where I'll read the note that she provided. But um, it's one of those things where you'd think that over the years with so many shootings and, and so many heartbreaking events that have gone on, that we'd run out of poems that we could write. And this is one of those poems that you know, just knocked my socks off again for the hundredth time talking about this really sad topic, um, which is the the shootings. And so let me read Abby's note to start out. Um, Abby said, I wrote this while sitting outside my daughter's school, waiting to pick her up from an engineering club where they learn to make balloon powered cars and popsicle stick catapults in a world armed with steel and fire. All the children killed at, sc- at a school in Tennessee this week were the same age as her. That morning, the Washington Post offered in-depth coverage of the blast effect, or what happens inside a child's body when an AR-15 round pierces it, because it is considered critical to public knowledge, and I suppose they're right. We, as a public, are being ignored by government officials who do not care how many times a day we're forced to imagine our own children dying or worse experience it. We are being shown how to picture it more vividly, how to maintain ourselves as part of the problem. My own hope can sometimes feel small as a dry kernel. My daughter's hope which is expansive and certain, is what might save it. So that was Abby's note. And I'll read her poem for her. This is um, Abby E. Murray. Once again, uh, unfortunately can't read herself. If you want to know more about Abby, though, you can watch Rattlecast a couple episodes ago where she was the guest. So um, feel free to check that out. But here's Abby Murray's self-portrait as a coriander seed. Specifically, one of many coriander seeds in an envelope my daughter bought at Little using a pinch of her birthday money which is to say she is only nine, has no income, nor any right to vote in a country where the leading cause of death for kids her age is a bullet made by and for voting adults. This morning, the newspaper shows how the round of an assault rifle blooms immediately when planted in the body of a child. My child, for example, or yours, the bullet a bit like a seed except this kind only grows an irreversible, merciless absence. See how I wrote those words and survived, how you read them and lived. You and I, we just keep getting smaller, more hardened. Whatever hope we have left is crouched within, waiting to germinate. We are not also children being taught to hide until we are told we're safe and pretend to believe it. My daughter is still young enough to love me unabashedly, as she loves cilantro, sowing one of her first independent dreams beneath a scrap of dirt in the center of the yard because I wasn't there to veto the spot she chose, a slight rise where the mower cuts lowest, its blades slicing so deep that not even dandelions have been able to sprout roots there till now. And I'm telling you, I'll mow around that place forever if it lets those seeds rise up, unfurling as slow and beloved as they like. I'll let the grass grow wild, and the tiny violets too. So that was Abby Murray's response to the school shooting in Tennessee, self-portrait as coriander seed. Um, we have another poet coming up, too, on Tuesday. We have a second Poet Respond poem this week, and Annie Grimes is here to talk about it. Um, hi, Annie. Are you there? Hi. Yes, I am here. Hey, Hello. Annie. Yeah, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining the broadcast and sharing this poem with us. Do you want to explain to everybody at home uh, what the poem is about? No one's read it yet. It's a preview of what's going to be up tomorrow. Yeah, um, yeah but what inspired it? Um, So basically, like a lot of people, I've been kind of paying attention to what's going on with the NCAA women's basketball tournament. Um, A lot of people have been talking about like Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese specifically. Um, I haven't actually watched the games. I'm not a big sports watcher, but I've seen a lot on TikTok of like, you know, her highlights and things like that. And it's always fascinated me, like the comment sections of social media posts that highlight like women's success in sports because it's a dark path to go down. Like I, I wish I had the self-control not to click on the comments a lot of times, but um, I don't. So I click on it and it 
ultimately makes me sad most of the time. What's interesting with what I found with Caitlin Clark is a lot of the consensus is about her being like incredible and but it's always a backhandedness mm -hmm. of the compliment um, that specifically come from men um, where they have to like qualify her talent by comparing her to like another male basketball player or say certain things that you know it's never a full-on compliment and I didn't know how to articulate how that made me feel um but then I had this experience like a few months ago in a local coffee shop where I was like overhearing this conversation that was happening at a table next to me and it was one of those things where it's like I I was writing down what they were saying I was like I'm gonna use this for something at some point uh, like in a story or a poem or something but I didn't know quite what that was and so then I was scrolling through TikTok seeing all this stuff um about Caitlin Clark and for somehow like in the writer's mind I guess it's like you know this connected to this conversation that I overheard months ago, but I didn't quite know how. And so like, as I got like halfway through writing the poem, I think I figured out how it connected, um, which was an interesting experience, but that's basically the background of how I came upon yeah. this poem. Yeah, well, it's a really interesting poem and a really great metaphor that you pull out of here. Um, why don't you go ahead and read it? This is um, how it feels yeah. when men attempt to compliment Caitlin Clark. And of course, Caitlin had a great um, showing. I don't watch, I haven't watched basketball. So mm -hmm. just because I don't have, a TV, so I, there's no way to yeah, watch it, and so eventually yeah. you just forget about you know what's going on. I used to though, mm -hmm. and would have loved it, but I guess she had like 40 points and a triple double, and then yeah. another 40 point game of just dominating and amazing. And uh, so here's the poem um, in response to the response to that. So let's hear it. Yeah. So how it feels when men attempt to compliment Caitlin Clark? If this is the future of the WNBA, I might just watch some man on ESPN's Instagram. Once at a local coffee shop, trying to pound some pages out of a story I'd hoped would write itself, I overheard a guy being so forthright with his date that I nearly choked on the iced mocha I choked down to stay awake. It was evident the two knew each other previously, that to him the topics of conversation came easily, and I tuned out the sound of the barista yelling names to the shop's crowd to better eavesdrop on the eagerness with which he spoke the most unbelievable truths aloud. You know about my Adderall addiction, right? He asked, and the woman laughed, and I noticed both her legs bouncing beneath the top of the table. I did Molly once with this girl at a rave, he raved, but I mostly just drink, and I think at that the woman smiled. Midway through a sentence, the man interrupted himself to admit he hadn't been staring at her tits, but they were nice, and if I recall, this came across as polite in context. You're really cool, and I don't care what anyone else says, was his concluding message, and the pair left together promptly after that. I shuffled in my seat, decently hopped up on the mocha, not one word typed and trying not to hate the way the humor of the date outweighed the weight it's witnessing left in my chest. Cause every woman I know is home to this particular brand of hurt. Knowing a man who realizes his capacity to care only after he realizes he cares for her. Yeah. What a, what a memorable scene to take place in that restaurant there. Um, and uh, that was how it feels when men attempt to com compliment Caitlin Clark. Um, let me ask you something to totally unrelated because you mentioned TikTok. Mm -hmm. And yes. um, I, you know, I kind of hate TikTok, but I wonder if mm -hmm. we should do something on TikTok to spread poetry there, too. Is there any is there any hope for poetry on TikTok, do you think? Because I don't think we've talked to any guests who have mentioned using yeah. TikTok before. It's so interesting. Is there anything there that, that you would suggest that we do? <laughs> That's interesting because... Um, I'm big into bookstagram, like mm -hmm. book Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, there's also like book talk that's more about like novels and things like that. Um, but in terms of like poetry I've seen on TikTok, it's um, it's a lot different than I feel like what Rattle's going for. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I don't know, I, I'm not the biggest fan of how much I'm on TikTok <laughs> as a person, but I was like, if I got like, I, it, maybe it justifies the time that I spend on TikTok, the fact that I got a poem out of it. But um I think there's interesting ways. It's just like a lot different mm -hmm. um, demographic or that yeah, you can reach. Definitely, yeah. I know. I mean, we definitely have the the demographic the demographic bomb or whatever <laughs> waiting, <laughs> ticking because we don't have. Uh, you know, we're not there. No, no pun intended. Mm -hmm. But at TikTok, I can kind of feel the the, <laughs> the average age increasing, and I don't know how to reach younger people anymore. So uh, mm -hmm. it's very interesting to think about it anyway. What TikTok might do for poetry, I don't know. Some to play with, but anyway, yeah, wonderful poem. Thanks for sharing this with me. Tomorrow's poem, uh, so Annie. It's been great to have you as a guest, uh, and, and good to meet you. Good to meet you too. Thank you. Yep. Take care. You too.
Me too. Yeah, that was Annie Grimes with tomorrow's poem, How It Feels When Men Attempt to Compliment Caitlin Clark. Um, now we're going to take a quick break and get back to uh, the show with uh, Dick Westheimer in just a moment. So sit tight and I will be right back. <laughs> And we're back. Thanks for your patience. Um, everybody here watching probably knows Dick Westheimer, a regular on the open lines for the last two years. It was exciting to watch him sort of have a meteoric rise in poetry. He was a finalist for the Rattle Poetry Prize. Um, we published him several times in Poets Respond. And now he's got a new book, A Sword in Both Hands, Poems Responding to Russia's War on Ukraine from uh, Sheila Gig Books. And um, Dick Westheimer and his wife and writing companion Debbie have lived on their plot of land in rural southwest Ohio for over 40 years. Uh, regular on the Rattlecast Open Mic, like I said. Um, Dick appeared in a bunch of Rattle stuff. Other poems have appeared in a forthcoming in Patterson Review, Well Road Review, Minoan, Gyroscope Review, and Cutthroat. And his debut collection is right here, among other poems that we're going to be sharing today. But here he is, Dick Westheimer. Hey, Dick, how you doing? Hey, Tim. I'm doing great. Yeah, it's good to see you on the first uh, the first hour of the show as a featured guest. I was I was um, when the book came out, I was wondering if we should have you on now or um, or wait until because this is a chapbook length book. I was wondering if we should wait until you're having a full length. But I think it's just so interesting to talk to you as somebody who came into poetry recently and has sort of grown up through Rattle and the Rattlecast in a way. Uh, it's really neat to have you on and talking poetry. Well, I appreciate. It. Yeah, rat, Rattle. I, I think I've spoken to you about this before, but I've sort of. Uh, piece together what I've thought of as a people's MFA, and part of it has been attending to the poets and interviews on Rattlecast, and and just absorbing what I get from those. So it's been an integral part to my growth as a poet. Yeah, it's been really great just over the years. I think we're almost four years up on the Rattlecast and five on the Critique of the Week. And to see all the people who are regulars just get so much better and better and better at poetry over time, it's just a really fun, it's sort of a validating um, you know, thing to see through poems, and, and you're definitely high up there on that list. Uh, do you want to start out by reading something? I think you want to start out with um, somebody else's poem again, right? Maybe we'll make that a tradition like John Evans started last week. Yeah, I, I really appreciated John doing that, and I gave a lot of thought to, you know, because part of this conversation is about what's happened in the last five or six years for me, and um, one of the most important pieces has become being part of a poetry community, and uh, back in 2017, when I took my first class, that the teacher sort of made a, um, a point of that. Her name is Pauletta Hansel. She's a rattle poet. Uh, I think she's been in a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And she's just a fine regional author. And I thought I'd read one of her poems sort of a, in homage to that whole community that I'm a part of. And it's a short one. I, I ran it by her because it's a it, for me, it'll be a persona of a, of a young woman who has uh, challenges, but uh, uh, it's her voice. And I thought I'd share it with you. And it's from uh, it's from her book, Heartbreak Tree, which I have right here. Um, so it's called Me Too, because I, too, was once 13, because I did not know I was too beautiful because he could, because everybody knew 
this flesh was what defined me, because men will be boys, because I was a perk of the job, because I only wanted to be seen. And that was Me Too by Paletta Hansel. Yeah, Paletta has been in a couple issues of Rattle. We should have her as a guest sometime, too, now that you bring her up. Um, but so so how, Dick, did you come into poetry in the first place? Because you're a poet who you have mentioned five years about how long you've been doing it. Um, what was it that made you, um, you know, start taking poetry seriously? And did you write poetry at all before that? Was there something that got you into this whole scene? Well, I had I had written at poems, you know, probably 20 or 30 in my life before uh, 2000, um, shortly after the election in 2016. And while I don't, uh, I can't directly attribute the election to my deciding to uh, focus on poetry. It had that was the timing was December 8th, 2016 or November 8th. Um, and I sent a group of poems that group of maybe 20 poems I had to a friend of mine who always admired my prose writing. And he um, said, oh, I love these. He sent them to a poet friend of his who wrote me a note back and said, these are fine. Have you ever considered taking a class? <laughs> it was sort of a, um, he, he sort of mentioned a couple of things he liked about a couple of them. And, and I took that as an opportunity and immediately sought out a class and found Pauletta's class in 2000. 17. So it really, it really came very quickly mm -hmm. uh, from just, you know, the smattering of mostly, you know, personal poetry to coming into deciding that I was going to study this. Yeah, I mean, there's certain times where poetry just explodes and, and is all over the place. And that the, you know, the Trump era election was one of them, you know, right after 9-11, um, of course, was the first one I experienced where when I was you know, I was just sort of came in as an editor on the tail end of that, where people were still writing 9-11 poems constantly. And there's that famous Sharon Olds poem about um, the, the the poem in the window on 9-11, too, that I, I always think about how just poetry finds people. Um, and then the pandemic, too, of course. So there's just sort of these certain times where it's that the age makes people want to um, want to you know read poetry and start writing poetry and get their thoughts expressed. Why do you think that is? What do you think it is about that time that, that made you want to not just read poetry, but, but be writing and publishing and engaging with it in that, on that level? Well, first of all, publishing wasn't on my mind. It was, <laughs> yeah. just, it was just writing poems. And uh, I, um, with the exception of a couple poems in a wonderful little journal called uh, Pine Mountain Sand and Gravel, which is a, a northern uh, a project of the, uh, um, oh gosh, I should know, but it's Appalachian Writers Cooperative. Um, um, my rattle poem, um, I like muons was, I think my third poem that I had published. So you were right at the, uh, at the beginning of it. I, I don't know. I've thought about this. I've sort of made up reasons why Trump's, uh, you know, election sort of spurred this in me. And I, but I don't have any sure answers except for the fact that it seemed to me that language taken seriously was an important thing for me. And I can't speak about those other periods. Mm -hmm. um, you know, why, why those? I can speak about the pandemic. And it was less, I think, about the actual pandemic itself than being cut off from all of the things, all of the other things that I did, the boards I served on, the plays and concerts I went to, the people's houses I went to. I just had time. Mm -hmm. And Zoom opened up uh, communities to to read with and spend time with. And, and other classes and things like that. Mm -hmm. But for me, it wasn't the episode so much as the opportunity. Yeah. Um, about that, so, so and then you took a workshop with Pauletta Hansen um, and, and started that way. Um, Caitlin Buxman wanted to know, and I, I meant to ask too, what about, you know, we picked a, a Pauletta's poem um, because of that, but then why that poem in particular? What does that poem um, speak to you? Um, I, I, first of all, I looked for one that, could get Pauletta's voice onto the onto the Rattlecast without a lot of time, actually. Mm -hmm. So for shorter poems, and that one just, I kept coming back to that one. And then I wrote to her and said, "Are you okay with me reading this one? Because obviously this is a very, um, but but it was it was it was the craft. It was hearing Pauletta's voice, which you know I go I've 
been to dozens of readings of hers and you know uh i i probably took you know 10 semesters of classes with her mm -hmm. and i've known her actually for a much longer time and i could just hear her voice i could hear her reading it and it's it's um exploring new ground for her um and so it it just struck me as as one that was important to this book and so that's why i picked that one mm -hmm. yeah and and uh so and now the the new book is a sword in both hands that you just published do you want to read uh the first poem that we have in the list there for that just so we can get into the swing of how that book's operating sure and i'll read the title poem mm -hmm. uh sword in both hands and and uh if i could preface it by saying the reason why i read this first and the reason why it's the title poem is is to recall that um, all of our instincts or my instincts, I'm going to say I'm going to I'm going to uh, validate my instincts about supporting the the Ukrainians and about the welcoming of Ukrainian refugees and understanding how how the this appeals to all of our best instincts, and then reminding ourselves that that particularly uh, Poland in this case in in Europe did not greet. Um, and the United States, for that matter, um, refugees from other parts of the world with the same sort of hospitality. Mm -hmm. So that that's why I like to begin the reading with this, just to sort of situate it in the larger view. So I'll read the epigraph first, which is from Dion Brand. One is misled when one looks at the sails and majesty of tall ships instead of their cargo. Dion Brand. A sword in both hands. We are a camera photographing itself, America. We are the majesty of tall ships, and we are the cargo, America. We are the jeweled sword, and we are the slain. We raise the blade and knight the brave in Ukraine, America. We bless them with crowns and say they look like America, America. We arm them with garlands of dragon-slaying missiles and javelins of the finest steel. We bear our sword arm, America, and we intone our money prayers. We strip the evil enemy of coin and commerce. We are money gods, America, and we do this with the right hand, America. With the left, we hold a pocked sword notched with brown, bodies, America. We place the sword in the hands of bonesaw kings who do not look like America, America, to slay those who the camera cannot see, because we say, America, that brown and far away are not America. Those who have before them other gods than America are not America. Their brave cannot be knighted by our jeweled blades because only those who we say are America are America. The camera that can only photograph itself is a mirror that only sees itself, is a sword that only slays itself, America. And that is a sword in both hands. The title poem to uh, Dick Westheimer's First book, A Sword in Both Hands, Poems Responding to Russia's War on Ukraine. And, of course, so many people were writing poems about the war on Ukraine last year. We were talking about one of those moments where we get a lot of poems, and that has to be added, too. We've had a, Maybe, unfortunately, we've had a lot of moments in the last few years where we're just piled on with um, Poets Respond-type poems because people want to write so much and engage so much with the news. What was it about the war in Ukraine that made you want to write a whole book about it? Because um, you're not Ukrainian. Um, you know, you don't have any ties, as far as I know, to that area. Um, what was it that, that made you have enough interest that you wanted to, to engage with it in this way? Um, well, as you know, um, I write a poem every week for Poets Respond. Maybe you don't know, but um, every, every week, one of those in your pile uh, it comes in from me. Um, and I had, you know, it was the top of news. And one, one of the things that was going on at the beginning of the war is the Ukrainians have been very good storytellers about the war. Mm -hmm. So early on, there were a number of, of metaphoric metaphor rich stories that came out of the the pr machine of of ukraine one of the poems i'll read tonight is an example of that um so first of all there was that then i heard uh julia um uh, kochinsky despot's 
amazing poem, Mirror in Ukraine, and heard her talk about um, a program that she was going to do with uh, Ukrainian poets. And I tuned into that. There were like 800 folks tuned in. And there were poets who were reading their poems from bunkers with bombs going off mm -hmm. above them. And it you know, remind me of, of some of the stuff I've read about people writing poetry in the Holocaust, which is they would they would find a chimney to hide in and charcoal to, you know, to write down charcoal that that people people in extremis will continue to write poetry. And I thought, now if you remember back to the beginning of the world, it was going to be over very quickly. But I thought if they could write. I could write. And I committed, and I, I didn't follow through on this, to writing until the war was over. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that proved to be forever, it, it appears. Um, but I it, it was the impetus. First, that it was news, and there were all these stories, and second, Julia's project with uh, Ukrainian uh, poets. And and the third is, is that any, um, any Jew of Ashkenazi descent has roots all over that part of Europe, whether that's their the, their immigrant family or not. So there there is a tremendous affinity for that entire um, um, Ashkenazi area where families roamed around for a thousand years when they were driven from one place to another. Mm -hmm. And I think we should say that the proceeds from this book go to is that the cherry the the organization that Julia mentioned, or is it some a different one? The, the Ukrainian it is the one. It yeah. is the one. Julia was very helpful in putting. Julia connected me with the artist who did the cover art, uh, and uh, Julia connected me with uh, Trust Chain Ukraine, mm -hmm. um, and I, I corresponded with them and found out more about their work and became committed. You know, I thought that that she had identified an organization that I could commit to. And yes, all the poets' proceeds go to Trust Chain Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Well, let's hear another poem from the book. Okay. Uh, the next one I'd like to read is Half Life's The Half Life of Portraits um, of War. And a little background. Um, I was watching an interview with uh, Lindsay Adario, and she said that uh, she had taken a picture, which is described in the poem. Uh, but she said, We survived and were able to bear witness to what happened, to see that family, the mother and the two children lying there on the ground, lifeless with their little suitcases, the most heartbreaking thing I've seen. And you can imagine this war correspondent photojournalist breaking down while she was describing this, mm -hmm. having seen this all of her life. And this was, so this is the poem. The Half-Life, a portrait of portraits of war. The witness displayed her portrait of woe. I bit my lip, my face wrenched tight, my rage unmasked, I kicked the cat. The cat, a victim of war, does not know about the toe-head child in the pink puffy coat, about her big brother in blue, his little backpack askew. The cat cowers as I walk by, but soon he forgets and nuzzles his blunt nose on my leg. How soon will I forget the toe-head child? her bloodied mother, the brother and friend, his roller suitcase, the dead. The witness will not forget. The soldier who tried to protect will not forget. The shooter will not protect, forget. Only the cat and Putin and I will forget. Yeah, the Half-Life of Portraits of War, again from Sword in Both Hands. And um, just a really... Um, important poem too, because we, you know, there's sort of a, there is definitely a half-life on these situations where we, we continue, you know, the stuff continues to go on just as awfully as it has for the last year plus. And I, I mean, I don't watch the news, so I'm not sure a hundred percent, but every time I turn the news on or look at the, you know, turn to some, it's not like a, the cover story anymore. It's not something that's, that's on the front of our consciousness. We got kind of a war fatigue just as spectators, which is kind of sad enough imagining that compared to actually living through the war where you're constantly under threat and the fatigue that in the real way that that happens. But we sort of get tired of hearing about it. And um, yeah. And so, so as the, as the war moved on, how, how engaged did you stay with this project? Was it something that you 
continue to write and focus on, or did you feel a kind of fatigue too? Well, well, first let me follow up on what you just said, which is, um, in reality, the suffering on the ground there is as bad as it was a year ago when I was immersed in the writing of these, you know, and, and when it when it was filling every news cycle. So you're absolutely correct. Um, um, and and secondly, I've I've been in touch with a Ukrainian diaspora group here in Cincinnati who wants to do an event with me. And uh we're we're in the planning stages. And I said, Well, what why poetry? You know, what you know, I've, I've offered it, but why are you so enthusiastic about it? He said, like, any way we can keep this in front of people because there is fatigue. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, we're co-hosting an event at the end of April uh, with primarily Ukrainian diaspora folks being the focus of the invitation here in Cincinnati, but other folks will be welcome. Um, and yeah, I, I, there are two poems in the collection that sort of reflect it, that there's the poem about eating pistachios, which, you know, was, you know, it's, it was a real, a real effect is that I was, I was growing fatigued of looking for these stories with the metaphors in them that might be there. And my wife and I were cracking pistachios on the table and she said, what's going on with the war? And I said, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And this is after following it so closely for 25 weeks. Um, so yeah, so I was subject to the same fatigue, uh, to the point that there needed to be poems to finish up the collection, um, to sort of round it out that I had to sort of, um, work to search for rather than them finding me. Mm -hmm. Um, how does the, the war in Ukraine compare to the other wars that you've experienced? You seem like the kind of person who would be anti-war throughout your whole, you know, dating back to the sixties. I don't know if I'm projecting, but it seems like that. Um, how has has your position changed at all, and and how does this war seem different in any way? Is it is it similar to Vietnam? Is it similar to um, you know other wars that that you've lived through and, and had to think about? No, not 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 at all. You know it 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 is, and and I've I've worked out on this with some Quaker friends who are you know, and some Gandhian friends, and um, to a person they will say this is different um because it it is a question you know there 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 is a poem in here that sort of explores um you know what what how is it that i am well it is the one about eating pistachios is that you know i cheer the shipment of arms mm -hmm. to people having um and and the reality is that that you know this war is people and there are other wars like this in the world where people are defending their territory, they're defending their homes, they're defending their language um, uh, to a an aggressor, you know, a merciless aggressor. Um, and that's much different than the United States involvement in the wars that, you know, that uh, I've been aware of the, you know, the wars, two wars in the Middle East and the, on, you know, the forever wars and other places that we've been fighting by proxy. Um, and, and of course the Vietnam war, which were all wars of, of choice with us playing geopolitical chess with other people and other people's conflicts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, if he, you know, similar comparison to maybe world war II and Hitler, you know, moving through other countries in that way, um, which, you know, makes things a lot different for sure. Yeah. Um, and I think even Gandhi, uh, you know, addressed this pretty directly and mm -hmm. I, I don't have his quotes on this, but it it wasn't that there was never a place for somebody taking up arms. It's just it wasn't the um, the the proper thing to do in most circumstances and in his circumstance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, let's hear another poem. Okay. Um, so this next poem um, is, uh, um, and it's on page 12. That's the one I didn't give you the page number for. Okay. Um, a Ukrainian woman confronts a Russian soldier in Henischek. And the little background on this that's not here, it, probably everybody on the call remembers the story of the woman who said, take these seeds and put them in your pocket so at least sunflowers will grow when you lie down to die. And in retrospect, this was part of you know, the amplifying of this story was part of the Ukrainian, and I'll, I'll use the word propaganda and not in a, you know, pejorative sense that, you know, they were trying to tell her a story that was going to get the attention of the world. And so they highlighted things like this 
uh, that occurred, but were you know would have been buried if it not weren't for their their own people looking for ways to sell the humanity of the Ukrainian people. Uh, and this is after Jericho Brown's uh, form called a duplex. What seeds will you carry in your pockets when you lie down among the worms and fungi when you die? Above ground, we, the living, won't comply with those who came here just to watch us die. None of you will see our spring blue sky, nor the summer yellow flowers blooms whose life is dead to eyes so glazed with winter's bleak decline. You whose pockets carry orders you should defy. Hold out your hand, accept what I've planted in your mind, heed the part that knows we are of one tribe, the all of all who hunger, love, and cry, who plow the ground for seed, not flesh or fl and flies. What will grow from the breakdown of your life depends on the seeds you carry when that time arrives. And that was a Ukrainian woman confronts a Russian soldier in Henechek. And um, it's interesting you talk about propaganda. Of course, um, you know, Edward Bernays, who wrote the book Propaganda way back in the 1920s, talks about how, um, you know, we, it sort of has a negative connotation, propaganda, but, but everything has to be propagandized if it's going to be spread. And so good, you know, things that are important to know need to be propagandized as much as things that, that are, you know, trying to sell products or, or spread bad messages that cause chaos in the world. Um, you know, if, if we don't propagandize what people need to know, then it'll be, you know, flooded by the things that people don't need to know and, and other kinds of propaganda. But I, I always found it fascinating because I think of propaganda as the actual opposite of poetry um, because because propaganda is spreading a preconceived message and and poetry and, and all the creation of art is, is sort of finding new meaning within the chaos of our experience. And so it's a really important f distinction to make, I think, with, especially, you know, the strong contrast here, because Ukraine's propaganda was so good, that story about the seed. But then you have to turn it into a poem and make art out of it, too, which is finding new meaning in something that was originally propaganda. And so how do you go about doing that? I think that's the key to, you know, having a, a meaningful poem um, that, that works really well, like, you know, tomorrow's poem or yesterday's poem or the poems that you've written for Poets Respond. It's always about sort of how do you make a poem that's not propaganda? So how do you how do you approach a news story and, and make sure you're not propagandizing? Um, well, I'll start by saying one one of the things I discovered early on, and this was early on in my in the classes that I took, is that if I knew what a poem was going to be about, in after the first couple of lines, I abandoned it. Mm -hmm. It just it just. Um, I, I needed to remain open to what I was going to discover in the poem. And I think that that, it, that sounds very simple, but I know you've talked about it as, you know, sort of a meditative practice or, you know, the, the, the equivalent of secular prayer. Um, but, but it really is, it's just how long, you know, and all of the craft and all of the uh, uh, technique that I've learned over the short period of time is about trying to keep my own, sensibility open to what might be discovered in the poem. Mm -hmm. And while that isn't the case in 100% of them, I, I would say that for most of what I write, there's just this point where I get to where something is where I I am surprised, you know, you know, the frost line. Um, um, or where I've, I've screwed myself, you know, there's another frost line where he says, um, Oh God! Oh, he says all our ingenuity is lavished on getting into danger legitimately, so we may be genuinely rescued. And so, a lot of writing is just sort of like how how close a space can I lock myself into that I need to find a way out. Mm -hmm. So it's really it's really just adhering to the the practice of keeping my mind open as long as possible in a poem, and then getting to the point where I know I have to find a way out. Yeah, I've heard you say before that 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 a a good poem needs to be dangerous in some way. Um, do you feel like you have a sense you've developed for the danger as you're sniffing out and writing a poem? Is that something you're pursuing? Like, where can I go that I don't want to go? Maybe is, is is that the thought that's in your head? Um. So it, it's one. It's one. You you know you we 
people talk about writer's block. People talk about you know the the, the sorts of things that uh, make them feel inadequate about about their poems. And I have to say, poetry is really the only second thing I've done in my life where I just fail at it all the time that I've pursued. Uh, <laughs> what's the, what's was, the first? <laughs> the first was school teaching. Uh -huh, you know, I'm yeah. an elementary school teacher and it I had such a miserable time at first, but I was really committed to becoming better at it. And poetry continues to be that way. And the biggest failure is is not being vulnerable enough in the poem to, you know, to get into that danger. You know, it's it's just it's dancing around the surface right at the beginning, and and um, um, uh, so many of my poems have opened up when I've sort of abandoned that protecting myself. Uh, now, you know, danger is is it, you know it's it's a relative term, right? You know, so what happens in each poem that feels dangerous is part of it is is that you've lost lost control of the poem that's a dangerous place to be as a poet where you're you're and not as a poet but as a person like you're writing something and all of a sudden you're writing something that wasn't doesn't feel like it was you and that's where you need to start finding finding the resolution of the poem mm -hmm. um well let's hear uh, another one okay um so uh this one um there was a picture and once again, I am sure that some of this was, well, I don't even want to say that. There's a picture of Volodymyr Zelensky when he came into Buka. Um, and the look on his face um, was in some respects more heartbreaking than the picture of the bodies bent and broken on the ground. It just shows what witness does to to a witness and realizing that almost everybody in Ukraine now has been a witness to some sort of some sort of horror. So this one is uh, called Witness, the Warring Lords and the Forever Price. And the epigraph is just from the Genesis part that talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. In the beginning, it was Lot and his daughters, his unnamed wife, those damnable angels, Sodom, Gomorrah, Buka, Erpine, all the same. Slaughter, panic, outrage, shame. This is the stuff of endless lists. The kind and number of disjointed bones, the chromatone of burning flesh, the breadth and width of skin as measured in pain. Kids' skin knees not kissed, scabs unpicked, toys crushed, the unnamed babies who will never go to war the named ones who will. I rip that page from my embattled Bible. Overhead, a lone goose sounds like two. Call and response, call and response. So alone, I look back to the remains of the terrible book. There, the limitless victims and the nameless wife, who I will call Salah. Her life as witness as she considers her immolate sisters, the lone goose, the good, the vagrant, the lascivious and chaste. Her gaze stays fixed on the crime, forever tied to the chasmed sky. She sees the hands that reach from the graves, the broken crutches, how blue the fire burns, how blackened the flesh, the dirt beneath the fingernails of the dead, the sins that are not sins, the sins that are, the gods who worship their own idols, the idols made in the image of their savaged gods. Only Salah looks back. She knows the price. She chooses to be a pillar of salt. Yeah, tough poem there, speaking of danger. Witness the Warring Lords and the Forever Price. Again, from A Sword in Both Hands by Dick Westheimer. Um, so so you mentioned doing, one of the things I wonder is, is what you did before you did all this. You, you took on poetry like five years ago. I know you taught, you're also, um, you know, you have a farm. And so you, I've seen you, amazing radishes and beets and things like that, that you're holding up in some pictures. Sometimes we get a lot of stuff in the poems. Um, what is the trajectory? I know you've done like philosophy too, and in college and things like that. What is the trajectory of your life been? It seems like you've done a lot of different things. Um, 
I have. And I've, I've, I've had some wonderful people come into my life during that period of time. So I was a school teacher, elementary school teacher at Cincinnati Public Schools uh, for uh, 16 years. I then went to um, uh, graduate school. And during that period of time, I worked as an educational consultant. Um, and I also met sort of my uh, number through the graduate school. It's when I developed a relationship with Ivan Illich. It's when my friend uh, Dan um, Grego introduced me to, to Wendell Berry. It's when um, I met my um, uh, sort of my mentor, who was the chair of my doctoral committee, uh, Jose Cedillos, who turned out to be, of all things, an honest to goodness shaman. Mm -hmm. And and Jose and I actually embarked on a, a project uh, to develop a creativity model that he had sort of um, developed uh, when when he um, was a child, and he and I worked on it after I graduated from graduate school. I then joined my father's business for a number of years. Um, I became very involved in local nonprofits, including helping resurrect a Shakespeare theater from the dead, uh, which is a favorite project of mine, mm -hmm. uh, and where I think I learned a lot about the language of, of poetry. Um, and then became a poet. I mean, it's, <laughs> well, you it's, skipped it's the whole farmer thing. thing too. How did you end up yeah. as a as a farmer? And does that have anything to do with poetry? I always wonder. I mean, there it seems like it's so rich with metaphor to be planting seeds in soil and and you know working them. It's sort of like what you do with your mind as you as you build up and become a poet. You can write about things because you're actually thinking about things. And there's this whole, you know, cultivating and nurturing that goes along with you know developing as a poet that way. Um, and so it seems like maybe having, you know, having that experience too helps you with your poetry and just a, from a process level. Do, would you say that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I'm starting to think of all the other things I missed. I, <laughs> for, for about 12 years, every week, I'd join a group of neighbors who were awesome musicians, uh, good old boys and girls in a, in a bluegrass jam, where I learned so much about the, you know, the rhythms of language and, 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 and what... Uh, there's so much, so much to learn about poetry, not not directly in the lyrics of the songs, although they're poetic, but in sort of how um, how the songs are layered on top of each other with very strict discipline, but also this sort of expansiveness. Um, and the gardens the same way. It's the gardens where it turns out that um, it's not just the metaphor of the garden it's the physical work it's the dirt it's the it's the um the, you know the actual activity of being part of that and i'm sure um yeah as as you as you've seen in a number of poems there are a number of direct metaphors that come from that but i think more important is actually the experience of being part of the seasons of being part of um you know one of the things a garden gives you is it's not really a sense of immortality, but it's a sense that uh, rather than time moving forward, that it moves in these, in these, in these cycles, and and there, um, everything is familiar every year as much as it is different, and that sort of opens you up to to metaphor, I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. Well, let's hear another poem. I don't know if you want to move on from the book to newer poems, or do you want to do another from the book? Uh, yeah, why don't I move on? Uh, yeah, I'm looking at time. Um, uh, why don't I move on to um, uh, the word for darkness is light. And I think I've shared this with a number of folks, maybe not you, but um, I bought a telescope and I decided, um, you know, I have some some uh, experience with uh, with um with it from when I was in high school and, a, you know, long affection for the night sky. But I just decided I'm turning 70. I need something new. And mm -hmm. I went out and bought a telescope. So I've had it for a week. And this <laughs> is one of the, or two weeks. This is one of the things that's come out of it. And this will be on one art in, in May. Okay. Called The Word for Darkness is Light. I went out tonight under the lantern hung stars took a bucket to collect the light poured from their quantum hearts and drank until I was tipsy, 
bewitched by their hymns, greedy for more of their secrets, which I promised to keep. But how can I not tell all who will listen the news? From here I can see the dark between the stars, and it contains more stars. Oh, that's great, especially thinking about the web telescope images that we've seen lately. And, um, you know, all those galaxies hidden in there that are older than the universe somehow or whatever it is that's making that happen. I love the wall at um, um, at the, the was it the Geffen Observatory, the, the Griffin Observatory in L.A. They have the wall with that huge star map from Hubble. And you can sort of just you just see all the, you know, all the stars laid out. Amazing. Um, one of the things people have mentioned a lot already on the chat is your um, your great reading um, of the poems. Um, there's a way that you really, to me, it's, it stems from really owning the poems and sort of believing in the lines and giving your own work the respect it deserves, maybe, is how you could put it. Is that something that you've had to cultivate or is that a part of like having that music experience that you talked about? Or is it just how you always are throwing yourself into things, you know, without worrying about it? Um, how do you approach reading and is it something you've had to develop? Because a lot of people have mentioned how well you're reading these poems. Um, well, it is something I've developed. I, I have a poetry friend. I, I call him at once a mentor, a friend, an equal. His name is uh, Dick Haig. And I heard him read one of my poems once early on because I was late to a reading that of a class of one of Pauletta's classes that I was in, and he read it, and I listened to him read it, and I thought, "Now that sounds great," and it sort of gave me permission to read the way I felt it when I wrote it, um, and. Um, part of my writing process is to read until it feels like I've owned, you know, I can own those words and the rhythms. I don't stumble over them and that, you know, they, um, um, you know, that they, they flow and there's sort of no, I, I don't start asking myself questions as I'm reading, but I do think it also comes from the uh, bluegrass experience because uh, you really have to put yourself out there. I don't know if, if you're familiar with bluegrass music, but most of the singing is high mm -hmm. and you just have to let loose. You just have to absolutely commit yourself to it. There's no way around it. And um, so that's part of it. But I think you got it at the beginning is like own your words. Like if you've written this thing, own them. And and I, you know, I feel I feel very committed and not just to the words, but to the reading, to the people who are listening to it. So that there's another thing. I'm a little ADHD. Uh -huh. um, and when I'm listening to readings, I am more engaged with folks who are owning their words. And I, and I want to give people who are listening that same experience. Uh, you know, not just respect my words, but respect the people who are, who are listening. Mm -hmm. um, and the final thing is, is they... You know, I, you know, I don't know if this is a sort of vanity, maybe it is, but they move me. Mm -hmm. You know, when I first started reading Sword in Both Hands, my, I didn't like stage my hands going up as I was reading it. It's just like, that's what it felt when that left hand comes up, the left hand comes up and um, I'm not going to deny that. Mm -hmm. How do you, I, yeah, I'm sorry. well, it seems like to, to be able to do that, you have to get past a sense of self-consciousness and, and sort of anxiety that so many people have reading poems. I mean, this is a live broadcast. Hundreds of people are watching now, um, you know, more in the future. And that to not have a worry about that is something that it seems difficult to cultivate. I know you've written poems about being shy as a like a teenager um, and, and having a lot of anxiety in that level. Is there a way that you've gotten through that that might be able to help people out? Because there's so many things. I mean, all the things that you've thrown yourself at in life require you not having that kind of self-consciousness. You have to jump into, you know, whether it's bluegrass or farming or the, you know, all the other stuff you talked about doing. You have to be able to go in, uh, like, with an open mind and an open heart and not be afraid of something new. So how did you go from that shy teenage experience that we've heard about in some poems to being open to everything and, and putting yourself out there completely in a, in a poem on a broadcast like this? Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I have a couple of people who are sort of like icons for me. One of them is my wife, who's always been like that. And when we met, I was, you know, I was still the shy guy the, in, in the corner, you mm -hmm. know, going to dances with her and sitting in the corner while other people would ask her to dance. Um, and 
Uh, so it's just observing, I, you know, observing how other people have, you know, are in the world and how them being that way gives other people joy. Mm -hmm. um, I have another friend, my a poet friend who I mentioned, Dan Grego, who I, I was with him in graduate school a lot. We became friends and I just sort of watched him and saw how the, the delight people got from his affability. And um, it's just continuing to learn from watching people I admire um, and and sort of adopting the best of what I think are the best of their ways without being too arrogant about it. Mm -hmm. um, and then feeling that that feels good to other people, that it's not an imposition on other people, that it actually, you know, it, it they share in, in my good, good experience. So, um, and I think also, you know, there's a lot that happens to one's self-consciousness as one's skin begins to sag and one gets older <laughs> and you just can't deny like who you are because you can't cover it up with youthful looks. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of it too. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of, um, you know, I, I'm really not good at small talk and, and at parties and things like that. I don't know what to say. And then I heard somebody say that, um, you know, just ask people questions because everybody is just as uncomfortable and, and has no idea what to say as you do. And so by engaging them in that way, you're bailing them out of having to think about what to talk about. So it's you doing them the favor to put yourself out there and thinking of it that way lets it lets me do that. And so I don't feel you know, uncomfortable about bringing something up or making someone talk about them or whatever. Just I ask them what I'm curious about and it works because I'm doing them a favor. And uh, it's a similar kind of way to, to frame it like, you know, being gregarious and open and, and, you know, forthright lets people feel good. And so it's a good way to be. So I really like that a lot. Yeah, it, 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 exactly what I'm, what I'm experiencing. The, the other thing, um, and this goes back again to graduate school and um, studying with uh, Illich was, um, you know, here is this intellectual giant who, you know, stood, you know, so many people have stood on his shoulders. And he, you know, I think one of the best thinkers of the 20th century. And if you asked him what's the most important thing to him, he'd say friendship. Mm. You know, it's just, you know, it, it is, you know, doing things in the context of, of being a friend. And um, I really watched him and watched my friends who were around him and just sort of understood that that's, that's sort of the, the engine for all of this is, is friendship. It's one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why I show up at Rattlecast every week, besides the poems, is just developing relationships and getting all the energy from the relationships with other folks who are enjoying the same thing I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm so glad you do. Everybody else is, too, that you, that you come here every week. Um, I should say I haven't yet. If anybody has any questions for Dick, this is your chance. It's an ask me anything, ask Dick anything um, time. But uh, while you gather your questions, let me, uh, let's me let hear another poem, Dick. What do you want to read next? Um, so I'm going to read uh, Miracle of Naming, which was a Rattle Poets Respond poem. Um, and the reason why I chose it um, is because, the, you know, there's a tremendous, um, uh, you know, um, risk of violence that trans people are facing just recently, especially uh, all the time, but especially following the Tennessee shooting. And it's just um, to keep humanizing um, those I know and those who I don't know in the, in the uh, you know, who, who are trans, I thought I'd read this poem specifically for that reason. Um, and this is called The Miracle of Naming. When I read of the murdered woman, Fern Feather, I thought of the myth of Icarus, because Fern had wings too, or at least feathers, although hers were ones she'd grown herself, were not sewn on by some other. She'd discovered a way through the labyrinth of her man's body, found the era um, I always mispronounce, Erevande's string of coming out and followed it, blinked back tears in the bright outside, was greeted as a kind of light, as a hot woman who warmed the world until some guy she knew put a knife in her for being a her. When I asked my daughter Fern's preferred pronouns, many all, she said, Multitudes, I thought. 
a miracle of naming. I go for a walk outside where impossible dandelions push through the pavement of our lane. They somehow have survived the crush of cars and me walking from here to the mailbox and back. Their butter yellow is splashed with muddy pothole water, their leaves bruised but still feeding the roots they've put down. No one welcomes these blossoms in some neighborhoods, would have me poison the ones that thrive here and in my yard. I've been slow to appreciate them myself, some days digging them out with a spiked tool, others sitting beside them, listening to them whisper their rugged stories, how they've been around since before my kind created time. I go back inside, call my daughter again, ask her about her coming out, ask about fern, talk about the world of spiked tools and poison and naming. She tells me of all the blossoms in her crushed world and all the impossible buds that will push through and bloom again and the ones who won't. Her partner joins the call, shows me the brisket they are preparing for Seder, tells me that these tough cuts of meat take time. I savor that they prepare such a fine meal together and even though I am a vegetarian, I ask for the recipe. And that was the miracle of naming uh, from about a year ago, exactly almost, um, by Dick Westhammer from Poets Response. So thanks for sharing that. Dick. a beautiful poem. I remember, it, you know, a lot of people found it very moving, um, you know, in a personal way when you when you published that one. So it's a it's a good poem to read again, especially at this time where it is, um, you know, a, a lot of um, dangerous talk in the air um, concerning that. I'm after the Tennessee shooting. Uh, two, two things. I, yeah, I, I got so much correspondence, especially from parents of trans, of their trans children, just saying like how for them, this was sort of a transitional poem for them. And it's just the power of poetry. And it's not, a, it's not an, you know, this is sort of my attempt at a David Kirby poem. I think David Kirby is the one who weaves the, all the all the things together. And I had heard him on Rattlecast and just allowing myself to bring in all of these different uh, metaphors, mm -hmm. these sidetracks was a real breakthrough for me in writing also. Um, so, so two questions here I want to get to from Cindy Gore wants to know, how do you separate darkness of news you write about from the rest of your day? Which is a question I always wonder about, too. I mean, reading, to be frank, I mean, reading Poets Respond every Saturday morning, I get kind of depressed and irritable at the end of it. And then you find a couple of beautiful poems that, that you want to read and read again. But but the, the the topics that we confront in the news and maybe it's because I'm sheltered because I don't don't pay much attention to news. Um, but, but, but seeing all the topics and all the bad news and all the terrible things that are happening in the world really gets you down. How do you, how do you get through that when you're writing poems about news and, and is, is the poem, are the poems a help? Um, well, I'd say they're definitely a help. I mean, the, the, the awfulness is out there, whether I write about it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and in some respects, and, and I'd say maybe a third or a half of my poems are, dealing with the awfulness and another half or two thirds are James Webb Space Telescope and, and uh, you know, the muons and, you know, a number of the other ones that, you, that you've seen in Poets Respond. Um, and, but, but the dark one, the darkness is there, whether you write about it or not, or whether it, I shouldn't say write about it, because I never think of poems as writing about something. Mm -hmm. They are something stirs an image or a metaphor in you that you're moved by. And that's what I look for in these poems, not the darkest story of the week, not the most current story, um, but the one that that um, enlivens me with with something I think will transform under under my my pen, something that is already a metaphor or something that is just a, you know, a, a compelling image. So um, the best that the poem can do for me is sort of transform it for me into something that that is not har not harm you know self harm mm -hmm. right which most most you know doom scrolling Twitter when Twitter used remember when Twitter was a thing um, <laughs> and um, 
you know, all, all of that, that's, you know, that's really harming ourselves. And the writing is the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Um, another question from Brent Stoffer this time. Has your approach to the empty page changed at all as your quantifiable success has grown? Well, I, I wouldn't, you know, there, there's a, a sense that the success might have bred a different um, relationship with the page. And it did very much at first, you know, that very first poem that you published. And I, I've written a poem about this since, um, you know, sent me into a tailspin. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, I've had my successful poem. <laughs> that, that'll be it. And um, But whenever that happens, it's like a week later, a poem starts writing, you know, starts coming out. Um, I'm really interested in the in the empty page. I, I work with a a group once a week for three years. We've had a poetics group, not a workshopping group, but where we discuss poetics, and we've explored a lot this notion of of the empty page. Um, and one of the members of the group, his name is Manuel Reese, a wonderful uh, Mexican American poet, uh, talks about poetry as uh, tra uh, translating silence. As a matter of fact, that's in one of the poems in the in the book. Mm -hmm. And I know Jory Graham has talked a lot about, you know, that about silence and the blank page and how important it is to so, sort of break the silence with something equal to the silence. And I'd say what's changed is that I've been in a group like that, that where we keep discussing these things and trying to understand what they mean for our poetry. And rather than pick apart poems, just sort of pick pick, dig into what is poetry. And so it's changed most definitely. And that type of group where we talk about poetics and other poems has been key. And part of that is talking about the blank page, not as a daunting thing, but as 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 the canvas, you know, as as or as as uh, um, an analog for silence and and what's coming out of the silence other than, you know, tires down on the on Route 32. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, a lot of um, metaphors appear um, as you talk about that, about the uh, the way the way poetry is breaking the silence. And, and um, you know, there's that tradition of breaking a pot at the beginning of a performance for the, the you know, huge, loud noise and the, the you know, with the Jewish weddings breaking the there. And then the um, you know, there's a whole bunch of traditions like that. And also like breaking the surface of a lake or something, you know, that that smooth this and then you jump into that and and things start to happen it's really interesting to think about the you know breaking the silence in that way and the, and the empty page in the same um let's see we have about a, a little bit of time do you want to do let's see let's do your second to last poem and then um maybe i'll make you okay. get out that guitar <laughs> for okay. the last one i think that'd be great um so um i think i'll read a custom coffin that was in real railroad review and this is an example i think was cindy who asked the question about how do you deal with it and um you know i cried when i wrote this one um just because it started revealing to me things that it just was unexpected um custom coffin and this was in response uh just to give it some background to this guy who made you know toy covered coffins for the Evaldi children um Custom coffin. If I die by bullet, I want my casket to be shaped like a gun. If by heart attack, place my ashes in an urn that pounds like a beaten drum. And if I drown, let the light of my body wash over the fun funereal crowd. But please, oh, please, if before my time, my child's child would be shot and died, don't decorate his casket with Lego bricks and decals of toy trucks. Wrap him in a shroud made of the dust of my crumbled bones. Bury him in a hole dug in what was once me, a pit so deep and wide that the whole of what was previously good in the world would fall into it. And great ending, especially there. That was uh, that was custom coffin from the Whale Road Review, which I'm uh, pull it up here so you can see. WhaleRoadReview.com is the website. I always like to show off other magazines too. 
Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about, Dick, is you know, having you know somebody who's been around the block, had a lot of experiences in life before you came into poetry. What is your sense of the poetry world and the publishing industry, and how much? Um, you know, do you feel, I hear a lot of people say that they, um, if you don't have an MFA, you, you know, you're like an outsider and, you know, everybody has an MFA and that's a thing. And, um, you know, there's so many magazines to deal with. There's like the do a trope and stuff. How have you like, like, what is your sense of, of the literary world as somebody who just entered it recently? I don't know if that's too broad a question to ask, but I'm kind of, I, I don't know. I'm kind of curious what you think. Yeah, I give it a lot, a lot of a lot of thought because you know at first I was just that C. I would just respond to Duotrope, uh, the Weekly Wire, and you know go on Submittable and see and just like just throw things. And then for a while I followed I followed poets into journals that they were in, um, but um, I've I've realized not all the journals are for me. You know, the, there are journals where the editorial board are MFA students, you know, uh, younger folks, and, you know, they have a different aesthetic and, um, um, or, you know, the, the first readers are all, uh, all younger folks and, um, and MFA students, and they have a different aesthetic than I do. So part of it is just finding, um, I know that you've uh, pioneered this word curator rather than editor or publisher who are curating poems that don't necessarily sound like my poems, but that just have this this um, this sensibility that I like them. Um, and that those are the ones that I um, I send to. But, you know, as a poet looking at the publishing world, I'm just looking for um, mag uh, magazines that have material in them that I like. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, it's hard to find. Uh, you have to read. You have to, like, actually do what they say on their page. If you want to submit to us, check out a few of our poems first. Um, and I don't know, you get a sense. That whole MFA thing, of course, is, you know, it's not, there, there are certain things that one is forgiven for if, first of all, you're not rely, you know, not trying to develop an actual career or a place in academia or a place where you might actually be able to make a living as a poet. Um, I don't have that pressure. I have the luxury of saying, I just want to learn how to write poetry. And that's why I've coined this People's MFA, which is, you know, doing this group with my poetics group, coming to Rattles Poets Respond, doing all the other things, all the other readings and listenings and, and studying I've done. Um, and um, yeah, uh, so I've, in some respects, it's not just that I've come to poetry late. It's that I don't, I don't have the, um, the the issue of trying to develop credibility in uh, any other way besides my poems. And I don't, I don't criticize, you know, folks who have that. I understand that's a real need, um, but for me, it's just not a factor. Yeah, and, and do you have any sense too of um, how to get poetry out into the people who don't read it? I mean, you didn't spend a lot of time in poetry for for you know, a good number of years. Have you have you had any thought about that? About which poems you know benefit people who don't usually read poetry, and do you write with that in mind at all? And 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 how do you do? You, have you thought about approaching that in any way, or do you just write what you write and and let the chips fall where they may? Um, well, it's it's. Yeah, I, actually, I think one of the reasons why I turned out to be a good fit for Rattle is that I, um, um, when I first started, I said, I want to write poems that my sisters will understand mm -hmm. who don't read poetry. They're, they're not, they're, they're both literary and all that, but, but, you know, they're, they're not into poetry. And, um, when, uh, my father, um, um, transformed by dying, uh, God, before you published it, I, I called them up and I said, I'd like to read this to you. And it's the first poem I had read to them. And we just had this wonderful conversation about my dad and memories came out. And um, But it, that's a rare experience where a poem connects uh, with people who don't read poetry. I'd say the poem I read about um, um, uh, Fern Feather um, the miracle of naming that connected with a lot of folks who are not, um, um, you, you know, don't normally read poetry. As did another rattle poem, the um, American Jew fails to 
make sense of the carnage in Gaza. So there's some that just work, but the key is is to, uh, to write them all as if anybody could read them. Mm -hmm. And the ones that will connect because of their content um, are accessible to people. Um, but it, it's not poetry is uh, it, you know it's um, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna proclaim it loud and proud, but it's the poop on the table in most <laughs> conversations. It's just like fine poetry. Let's talk about <laughs> yeah yeah. I just I still don't for the life of me I don't understand why that is. I don't know if I ever will. Um, one of the things you do though is write songs, and um, and you you have a song that you you might I mean, you might be able to talk me into you know I might talk you into playing. Uh, you yeah. mentioned, but but before you do, um, how how are, is songwriting different? Like, how is it similar and different from poetry? Is there a way that because you have melody to play with that you're allowed more freedom, and, or do you approach a poem as this, in the same way as a song? Um, so I think they're totally different animals. Mm -hmm. um, this 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 was an old poem of mine, um, and you'll notice if as I go through it, it has some elements of of poetry you know it has a you know rhythm and image and all this stuff um it doesn't have real movement in it it doesn't have some of the elements that that will drive somebody through a poem without music mm -hmm. so if you just think of music as sort of you know what a poet has to do is has to make the music in such a way that uh, and make the rhythm and make the forward movement and the arrangement you know think if you think of a whole song uh, the song has just the words of a song don't work. You have to have these other elements that move people mm -hmm. uh, th uh, through it. So they're really two different things. And and in some respects, one of the things that's suffered in the last two, two or three years is I haven't written any songs mm -hmm. uh, because they they both are sort of like they consume a different different part of my head. And I just haven't had, um, I, I haven't had that impulse mm -hmm. because the creative impulse is being not used up. It's being used in a different way. Do you, is there a reason but, why? I mean, do you, do you get something different out of poetry? Like why, why didn't you just continue to write songs? I mean, why didn't you write, you know, I like muons as a song. Um, you know, yeah. if you're, if you're, it's still a creative expression. Um, is there a reason, is there something you get out of poetry that you didn't get out of writing music? Um, I think it fits me better. Mm. I don't know. You know, it just, it, this, this, this practice, writing songs was never a compulsion. It was never a, it was never this thing that, that I couldn't wait to get back to, you know, that I have a problem, Tim. <laughs> I will have a poem drafted on my desk and I'll walk out and do some garden work or do some business work or work on another screen, what I'm trying to do. And if I peek in and see the screen glowing, I have to get back there to work on the poem. It is an addiction. And songwriting was was never that sort of like draw for me to, um, I loved it and I love making music and I love, uh, you know, I, I have a modicum of, uh, yeah, I, I have enough. I have enough talent that I can satisfy myself when I sing a song. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but there's something different about what poetry has 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 triggered in me. Mm -hmm. And I use the word, you know, triggered in a positive sense. I I think it's positive. Sometimes my wife would say it's not positive when she feels like she can't ask me a question because I'm buried in you know a draft of a poem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Well, we're uh, definitely we're so glad you're here, Dick. And and since you offered, I, we would all love to hear you play this uh, tilling of the greening rye. Okay, and I do hesitate to you know sing at um, poetry readings because singing gets applause. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't matter. That's what you do at the end of a song is, and it's just a you know think about that is how different the animal is that people's impulse is like to applaud. Um, a song and to sigh at the end of a poem yeah yeah definitely big distinction so don't applaud even if you feel like <laughs> okay okay and excuse me for having a dry mouth for having talked for an hour you know problem while you get refreshed dick and get drink a little water i will say there's an open lines after the show so um sit tight after dick and uh have a poem ready i'll give you instructions if you want there are a lot of people here still we still up at 70 people live on youtube 
Uh, so there are a lot of people probably here who aren't used to the Rattlecast and don't know that there's an open mic. Um, so have a poem you'd like to you'd like to read and join in if you would. Uh, there's a way to do it by emailing me the poem and then joining the Zoom, which I'll tell you about later. But but have that ready and stick stick around uh, after Dick. But let's hear let's hear a song, Dick. I, I can't wait. And I'm gonna turn down my microphone a little bit. And can you can you hear everything without yeah. distortion? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're good. Uh, okay, hold on just a second. I just made. There it goes. It's called The Tilling of the Greening Rye, and it's just, it's my song I sing every year around this time. The greening rye and the drying brown ground, these things surprise me every spring. So green the rye that I plow down, so brown the earth we're tilling. The bluing of the graying sky, the rippling of spring waters. So blue the vault neath which I lie, so warm these days of wonder. The reddening of the maple bloom, the white magnolia blossom. The rolling thunderous spring rains, the work the winds left undone. The green when tilled with brown it smells, spring rains mixed with winter. The fallen leaves and churning worms, a touch of sweet and bitter. The gathering winds dance with the trees, makes me think of holding. All that I love dear to me, the mysteries unfolding. To bow and bend and hold the soil, to offer it to growing, not merely greens, sweet peas, and corn, but all that I am knowing. Oh, that was great. And I'm trying not to applaud Dick, but uh, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, thanks for sharing that. Real treat to get to hear. I mean, we've, we've seen the guitars in your background all these years, and uh, really cool to hear you play. Thanks for, for doing that. Uh, it's what what a treat, and I've I've just enjoyed so much uh, getting a chance to talk to you for an hour. It's been terrific. Yeah, definitely. So the big question everyone wants to know now, Dick, are you going to come to the open lines too? Of course, I'm going <laughs> to. Okay. Nope. Did you write a prop room. poem this week? <laughs> yeah. Uh, if there's room, it looks like uh, yeah. you, you might have quite a few people there. But yes, I will. I guess I'll just stick around. Yeah, just stick around. So, (laughs) okay. So Dick is going to sit right here and we're going to move on to the open lines portion of the show. Like I mentioned, we do this every week. Um, If you'd like to join in, I will be putting the Zoom link into the chat windows on Facebook and YouTube. So um, look for the Zoom link in just a second. But first, email your poem so that we can show it on the screen like we were showing with Dick's because it's always better to read along. Email it to openmic at rattle.com that's open mic at rattle.com only only do that if you'd like to share a poem uh, only join the zoom if you'd like to share a poem the broadcast continues if you just want to listen to other people's poems and enjoy them sit right where you are but if you'd like to join and share a poem we have about an hour and a little bit uh, we'll get to as many people as we can i pasted it into the youtube screen and i'm also pasting it onto facebook and people are starting to trickle in already we'll get to as many as we can on the open lines in just a minute. So sit tight, be right back, and uh, I'll see you on the open lines.
And we're back. Thanks for your patience. Uh, like I said, the open lines is coming up. We have uh, 11 people so far as people come in. It's going to be a one poem max, I believe, uh, which I think it's just been like that for a long time now. Um, as we, you know, we always have plenty of things to fill up the, the hour with. Uh, if you want to share a poem and it's new to you, there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, you can share a, a poem about current events from Poets Respond that was, you know, something that was submitted there. You can, um, you know, have a poem that you published recently, or you can do the prompt. And we have a prompt every week. The prompt this week was right here. Um, let me put up. The prompt this week was to um, write a series of small poems as journal entries this week. Each day, write about a small detail that you would want your future self to remember. And so I thought, um, I, I, don't, I don't know, I thought I, I've always wanted to write a guzzle and that, that works. I've tried many times to write a guzzle and, and very often it just doesn't, it's not working for me. I thought I'd try again, given we have seven, seven days of this journal entry thing, uh, could do seven. So what I did is I, I, I looked for something while I was walking the dog. So I walked the dog every day. Something that I walked past and thought about, and then I'll add this to the guzzle and I'll make like a week guzzle thing and we'll see i don't know i just talking about as dick mentioned about um danger <laughs> i just couldn't find the danger in this um, and so maybe it doesn't have any but here is my seven days in march guzzle uh here we go seven days in march guzzle the whole world is a world dipped in snow on the mountain nothing is plowed there's nowhere to go on the mountain by noon jim reached what was the road he waved his shovel like a flag you lifted yours, our plastic hello on the mountain. Behold, the streets turn to rivers, how they carry alluvial stones. All water returns to the sea, every face becomes toe on the mountain. A tractor scours the outfield, its wheels printing words, each line a verse. It gets stuck in the mud, writing is slow on the mountain. Red through to violet in the morning mist of the grocery store parking lot, more than a rainbow, a rainbow on the mountain. Opening day, the kids skin their knees on frozen grass. Once again, the pitchers climb the mound, thrilled to throw on the mountain. Go on, Green, write your poem. Each word is a word for snow. How fast they melt. That's the lesson to know on the mountain. So that is my seven days in March guzzle. We did play baseball. I don't know if you noticed, I have like a bit of a black eye from, <laughs> from a little league experience, too. Um, pay attention when kids might be throwing you balls. Um, so that was a fun, you know, to go from that snow to um, an actual field you could play on was kind of interesting over the course of the week, too. So I don't know. There you go. But anyway, that was my guzzle. Let's go uh, first to Katie Dozier. Hi, Tim. How are you? Hey, Katie. How are you doing? I love the show so much tonight. I have to say to Dick Westheimer that he really inspired me because I want, it, I want to have my own meteor prize like this with Dick Westheimer to have. And if people's MFA is like what I'm shooting for too, with taking advantage of everything on rattle and doing all of it. And I've learned so much from him. So I'm really grateful. And now I've learned that he can also write songs, which seems almost unfair if he's capable of all these things. It really does. But uh, I don't know. I mean, you could pick up some songs too. Who knows? I've written one song and I have a guitar hanging on my wall too, but I'm not getting it down. Let's just say that. Maybe, maybe someday. We'll, someday we'll get you to it. Uh, Someday. <laughs> so, so what do you have that you'd like to share? Well, I decided to take this in the direction of a haiku sequence. And I just realized that technically I violated the prompt because I had six haiku, which does not a week make. So. <laughs> it, it does not. But I, I was thinking about that, though, before we did the prompt. Because, um, you know, we, we said it like Monday night. And then you can't really do one after yeah. a late show Monday. So it kind of and then you kind of have to finish. So six, I was thinking six would be fine. Yeah. But today. Okay, good. Seven, so I passed. Yeah. I'm, I think I'm you did. I'll give you a solid A minus. How about that? All right. Before reading the poem. Great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is White Picket Fence Haiku Sequence. A daffodil faces the sun. A child paints. Black paint dries on a brush, unsung lyrics. Pop lyrics float up to the sky, bubbles. A bubble held on a wand, spellbound. Spellbound, the spring falls back to winter. Winter's final breath, a crocus. Yeah, great, great haiku sequence. And I love that. I think we talked about that with Michael Dylan Welch. And I can't remember what, I think he didn't even know what that was called to link 
to link one line with the first line of the next. Um, but I love the, the first haiku and the last haiku especially. Thanks for sharing those, Katie. Always a pleasure. Thanks so much. Thanks for all the great poetry tonight. I really enjoyed it. Yep, definitely. Take care. Bye. Bye. That was Katie Dozier. Um, and as you probably know or might know, me and Katie host a space on Twitter. Uh, speaking of, you know, Dick said Twitter doesn't exist anymore, but it does. And the space, uh, spaces are a fun feature where it's kind of like a group conversation. And Dick is actually there very often. Um, this week, on, it's a Thursdays at 3 p.m., just talking for an hour about poetry stuff. This week, we're going to be talking about AI, which is going to be really interesting. Uh, I'm looking forward to that, especially with our NFT Poets issue coming up. Uh, Sasha Styles, I interviewed her for the issue, and uh, she talks a lot about AI and uses that in her poetry as well. So we we'll had a lot to discuss. Let's go, uh, let's go next to uh, Sharon Ferrante. Hi guys. Hey Sharon, how you doing tonight? Hey. Okay. Good. Oh well. Well, really good because I, I want to thank you and Dick so much for the interview. And um, I just—he is so powerful and wonderful and such an inspiration. I can't stand it. <laughs> I don't even care about my poetry anymore. Okay. I just well, we want to listen. Care. We care about your poetry, Sharon. So. <laughs> I just want to listen to, to okay. Th thank you both so much. Yeah, I did a, I did the pom pom, mm -hmm. and I did it, I did it, kind of in a, a, a haku sequence, but really it doesn't go together. But, but kind of, and I ended it in a charita, uh, but it was fun. Mm -hmm. I never did kind of like a journal thing before, so it was a lot of fun. Thank you. Very cool. Okay, well let's hear it. Yeah, I'll share. An ordinary journal, four crows, empty bag of peanuts, market run, dragonflies, swarm before the storm, patience, an egret under the oak, earth, how hard is it, walk softly, Quiet, the sand between my toes. Fresh air, one breath changes everything. A neighbor shrill, the crows frighten her. I read the first entry in my journal. Oh, that was just wonderful. Thanks so much for sharing that, Sharon. A master of the short form, really. An ordinary journal. I love all those haiku, especially the egret one. Um, and then the treat at the end. Really cool poems. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Okay. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, bye. Yeah, that was Sharon Ferrante with um, an ordinary journal from the prompt. Um, let's, let's go. We'll just go in the order folks showed up, unless they see some brand new names. But here's Carla Schwartz coming up next. Hey, Hi. Carla, how you doing? Hi. I'm wonderful. Glad, glad to be here tonight. Fantastic everything. Uh, I will mention one thing that, speaking of songs, I actually put this song that I have as a it, for the Tiny Desk concert. And I could put a link in the chat on YouTube because... It's important because it's uh, called I'm an Alien to a Policeman. Hmm. And it's, you know, relevant to all the horrors of police violence. Wait, but, I, um, th that's your song or a song? Whose song? My song. Yeah. My song. On the, tiny, yeah. on the NPR's Tiny Desk concert? Thing? I put it on there because I thought it was just so important. I, <laughs> oh, I wanted that is so cool. Yeah. Visibility. So I'll put it, the link in the, in the chat. But um, the poem that I have tonight is a prompt poem. Uh, but my, it's my interpretation of the prompt. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I while, last night at the rattle class, I was talking about speaking, starting your poem Monday night. <laughs> <laughs> I was sending an email to somebody at the same time I was listening to the rattle class. So instead of writing surgery, I wrote poetry. <laughs> that word. Uh -huh. So the title of my poem is "For Happiness." Substitute poetry for surgery. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to have knee poetry next week. I have arthritis and need poetry. They want to test my colon for cancer. If they discover even a small nub, 
I will have to have poetry. They also want to test for cervical cancer by skimming the surface, a small bit of poetry, a biopsy of poetry. Oh, breast cancer, double mast poetry, then reconstructive poetry. The hospitals charge a lot for poetry these days. Poetry is dear, but I need poetry to live. Without poetry, there is no hope, or there is only hope. With poetry, you can't help but hope. When grieving, substitute poetry for death. Someone dear, some once dear friends of mine, now just memories, we've lost touch. I search obituary obituaries for each one to know whether they have become poetry. My son has entered poetry. My son, too. When I think of my son, when my tears overwhelm, poetry, poetry. For chemotherapy, radiotherapy, substitute poetry. Once the doctors hit a mass in the mid in the pit of your intestines with poetry, you might still become a poet. Hair, once thick as summer, your eyes a clear stream. Oh, beautiful, moving poem. Thanks for sharing that. For happiness, substitute poetry for surgery. Great use of that substitution. It really, really works uh, as a poem. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Carla. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, that was Carla Schwartz with uh, For Happiness Substitute Surgery. Let's go to uh, a first-time caller. Um, Rosemary Bohm is here. So I'm going to ask Rosemary to unmute, and then we'll say hi. Hi, Rosemary. Right. Oh, I think you're uh, I'm not hearing any sound. So you unmuted, but I think the um, – let's see. But I think the, your computer is not picking it up. Hmm. Yeah, I think maybe it's something to do with like the microphone. It's not actually, it's not actually Zoom itself. So we'll try again and come back to you later. Uh, let's move down the line. Let's go to Caitlin Buxbaum. Hello. Hey, Caitlin. How are you doing tonight? Oh, I am exhausted to tell you the truth, and oh, really yeah. ready for the school year to be over. Isn't it only? Like, I... It's like three o'clock in the afternoon in Alaska, right? It's five forty. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been I guess you're reading the hook, papers then. all day and uh -huh. yesterday and I was out sick on Friday and I'm just like you miss one day and you have three days of things to catch up on somehow. I know, I know the feeling with the, the poems coming in. I feel like I always feel like uh that, yeah. that Lucy I love Lucy scene at the chocolate factory where they're trying to get the the chocolates and then you just keep eating them. Anyway, that's that's my life with the poetry. So um <laughs> <laughs> So what do you uh, what do you have to share with us? <clears throat> So I think I only watched the last um, Rattlecast like a couple of days ago and or maybe I only looked at the prompt um, a couple of days ago. So I was like, well, I don't I can't like go back in time and do this. So what I did is I looked at my journal entries from the last uh, week, mm -hmm. which were not every day, and then um, pulled out the things I thought were interesting and and put them in a poem together, which I did not expect to work, but I don't know. I think it kind of <laughs> works, I guess. It's still a first draft, so. Very cool. Well, let's hear it. Let's see. All right. Tentatively titled, The Week I Get Food Poisoning. A woman named Diamond says she comforts people in her dreams, and they know. My great-grandfather, I discover, came from a Croatian town of 64 people, maybe. My father says, these are people who didn't trust governments. Sometimes I wonder if we aren't all a little too much of who we used to be, but not enough of where we come from. Sometimes the doors between worlds briefly open. Oh, that's very cool. I love the way that jumps around in surprising ways. Similar, it reminds me of the uh, last a week from Sunday's poem that, you know, the, the way it shifts between different things and topics. I think it works really well. Uh, the week I got food poisoning. Sorry about the food poisoning, though. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty lame. Yeah. But, uh, 
really, really cool stuff um, with, with my dad and my family history that I found out. So mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, yeah, that's all I got. Love the show. <laughs> um, hope to, to be on more. Oh, I was going to mention, mm -hmm. I forgot it's because I'm so tired. Um, Poetry Society of New Hampshire, their next journal. I'm not editing that anymore, but um, submissions are open through the 15th. Mm -hmm. Poetry submissions and um, the rest of the stuff, I guess, only really applies to Alaska people. But I'm doing a poetry <laughs> workshop next week, and I and there's uh, a well, there's a fiction contest for mm -hmm. Alaska Writers Guild that's open to everybody. So if any of you guys write fiction, very go cool. For it. Well, but, and you're if you're an Alaska writer too, <laughs> also that. Yeah, I doubt I doubt there's anyway, anyone on here. Very cool. Thanks. Yeah, and check out the Poetry Society of New Hampshire, uh, which Jimmy Pappas is involved in too, of course, where that all comes from. Thanks, thanks, Caitlin. Always a pleasure talking to you and, and seeing a poem. Mm-hmm. Yep. You too. Bye. Bye. It's Caitlin Buxbaum with uh, the week I got food poisoning and hope the week goes a little better that in that regard. Um, let's go to uh, Stephen Croft next. <clears throat> hey, Tim. Hey, Stephen. How are you tonight? I'm, I'm good. Uh, I'd like to do a responding to the news poem. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I had this in mind for Poets Respond. And so I wrote a contributor note. But I tried the new verse news with it because uh, James there usually gets back in a day or two. He does. It's a nice thing took, about that. He took yep. the poem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he took the poem, so it went there. But uh, it's about climate doomers and how they are outpacing now climate deniers as the people whom we need to convince that the world should be saved. The hmm. doomers think that we're doomed and uh, that there is no saving the world. Yeah. Um, I, this, this is my, uh, disclaimer for the poem, my contributor note. After reading the Washington Post's Why Climate Doomers Are Replacing Climate Deniers, I don't mean to make light of the existential climate tragedy that is relentlessly unfolding. For me, it is mad despair. We are supposed to watch sanely as our world's governments preside over the normalization of Earth biosphere destruction, and then all exist calmly in this collective bowling frog syndrome. Hmm. So uh, this is Doomer Madness. If I am mad, it is mercy, H.P. Lovecraft, the temple. Boundary between our world and the speculatively doomed one finally dissolved. We all just sing with ACDC now as the world burns, as we inherit the hurricane winds. A man in Kentucky carries a mattress on his head, wades from his flooded house to dry ground, collapses on it in despair, lights a cigarette and, and laughs at all his, our ruin. A few years ago, just the faraway Seychelles were disappearing. Now, shunning sedate natural laws, future ghosts enter our minds. Oh, our prophetic souls, telling us all is irreversibly rotten. It's not like we were never warned, but now, the world of Solent Green 2022, a year ago, if all that's left is to fail, we've got catching up to do. Now, loud muffler rumble pride of our gloriously gas-powered, world-castrating civilization as it races us all to the fiery oblivion of Satan's eternally beckoning ancient mouth, sons of perdition. Now, Paris Accords ripped into victory lap confetti for those who can make it first to this perverse ever after. What of those who still cling to hope in the sweat throes of our mania? Soon as Seychelles erasure goes nuclear, our heads spinning faster than the earth some already orbit, the lucky few, even the hopeful, will cling to their rockets like Afghans fleeing Taliban. Oh, important poem there. Definitely something that I've always been bothered by is just the, the, the doomsday nature, the misanthropy that comes into play for kids, especially, you know, that that's the world that you think 
you know, and, and how much that affects your, your psychology. And I don't know if we're going to have anybody available to face the problems that we face. We're going to have to have people who are strong and resilient and, and um, you know, have hope. And if there's none of that, then uh, there's not much hope to have. So, so definitely important poem to share. Thanks for that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. It's Stephen Croft with Doomer Madness. And again, that's from Newverse News, which is um, um, a great alternative, or I shouldn't say alternative, but it's uh, another way to go about poets respond poems. So we, you know, we get like two hundred a week or so, and we publish one or two. Um, everybody can submit in, in Newverse News. I think they do one every day. So um, it's another great opportunity. It's news newversenews dot news is where you can find that, or newversenews.blogspot.com. Always a great place to find extra Poetry Spawn-type poems. Let's go next to Audrey Friedman. Hello. Hey, Audrey. How are you tonight? Good. Love the love tonight. I mean, uh, to have found this community of friends, inspiration, knowledge, support. Um, I'm just Aww. totally impressed with all of you. Uh, Dick, you did a fabulous job. All right. I got carried away with this prompt. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, palmetto and a crescent moon, a haiku diary. Oh, cool. A lot of people went to haiku, which is fun to see after we've done a lot of haiku stuff. Victorian doll houses made from balsa or cardboard, gingerbread trim, snaps. Redneck trucks on sand, raw like the Loch Ness monster. Hikers do, excuse me, bikers do wheelies. Restaurant owner's dad was connected, thus the food was rich. The hungry ocean inches forward to nibble my sand-covered toes. I throw my ideas far out to sea, knowing poems will wash in. Carolina breeze, a wash with early pollen and potential. Fish in the lagoon, the only ones not sneezing in the chartreuse rain. Thick oaks lean in silent conversation, age-old debates. Gurgling water arcs from the fountain and splashes hushed rain dreams. Return wide mouth bass under specified size, submerge for baptism. Blue heron stands statuesque on spindly legs relishing each glint. Beware of gator concealed in swamp grass, hunting for monogamous love. Oh, very fun. I Thank love you. those. Thanks for sharing those, Audrey. And uh, my favorite, I think, was the, um, where is it? The uh, the fish in the lagoon, the only ones not sneezing <laughs> in the chartreuse rain. I love that thought of That's <laughs> the, about the, it. The Welcome fish. to South Carolina. Yeah, excellent. I felt it was a journey there. I really enjoyed getting to walk around South Carolina with you. Thanks for sharing those. Thank you for inspiring me. Yep, our pleasure. Thanks a lot. Uh, Audrey Friedman with uh, Palmetto and a Crescent Moon, a Haiku Diary. Our next up is Mike Bales. Congratulations to Dick, first of all. He's always got a great rhythm and a great reading. Um, yeah, for sure. I can I can learn just about a lot from him, from the featured poets, which I've said. I like his idea of poetics. If I could get to a group, we've got like a poetry group where we critique each other but to talk about poetics i thought this other writers group was going to have something to do that i would have presented one of the rattlecast uh poets for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a little long but i won't read the entire thing i actually wrote this as a journal oh cool I actually mm-hmm. started at monday night because sometimes I, i'm overly eager <laughs> and then from then on it's the mornings i tried to be immediate but i think a theme might emerge from this I won't read the whole thing, but I'll read a bit of it. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Um, the title that kind of popped out of all this is called Conceived. Shadows of Night 
intimacy. The the second thing I sent you is probably closer, but I've got some more revisions right here. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, conceived. Shadows of night, intimacy of a small room, voices of poetry zoomed in soft refrains to be followed by song. First words are best, but they are forgotten. But last night's song lingers, the scene where a woman sitting at the bar calls my name. I see faces of old loves and highways as they cross the land. Branches left bare wave as they wait to take on new life. The sun glows through a veil it wears, an awakening on a quiet side street. Sometimes when, alone in a room, I want a love that lasts so long, we run out of words. And each day, we look for something to say. I, or I suppose we could invent new words. Clouds linger, could be rain, or the sun break, breaks through. I, I hold imaginary conversations with someone who I once knew. There were words said. Then I open my laptop and read an, an article read yesterday goes to screen. So much to say, and the refrigerator is droning when I'm left with my thoughts, as if I live my life for this moment to sit down and write last night i dreamed bridges were falling my life once filled with bridges and crossroads but i have so many places to go and my if my life is a story i don't know where it will end this weekend i'll see a friend met at karaoke and when the music pauses and when we're left to to ourselves i'll tell my story the touch of our hands lingers when we give each other high fives to to glow to the glow of neon lights. Life eddies itself, old jobs seen in new ways, old conversations with old friends as if they were brothers. Unfinished conversations. What what didn't they understand? What didn't I understand? The West End where fathers were happy just to go to work and come home to the family meal. And everyone kept quiet while my father watched network news. But in my heart, I always wanted to write a poem. And there were wars. And someone died in the highway, as someone always does. In the middle of a sweat switchyard, a white tower intrudes in the sky. And the sky to the west glimmers as it calls, as it, as it calls, vast and free. There's more, but I'll stop there. Yeah, very cool. It's again, it was really fun to move around with you through the week, Mike. Is it something that you do? You usually write a poem a day, or is that uh, is that new um, to you? <clears throat> when I was new and they weren't nearly as good, I was uh -huh. going, I'd see a blank page and I'd write a poem, up, and I'd go, I can do it. When I was new, I'd write up to two poems a day. Now it's like a few a week. Uh -huh. I also work on short stories and have had some contests, so sometimes I'm doing a little bit of that. So this is actually kind of journaling journaling poetically and hoping a theme emerges from mm -hmm. from it which i kind of think it does yeah it's, i started to see so, it too yeah thanks for sharing that mike you're really fun i, I like this experience okay. of seeing daily journals yeah thanks mike okay thanks yep bye it's mike bales with uh conceived let's try rosemary mary uh balm again she looks like she's well, uh, Can you hear me now? We can. Hello. It's great to see you. Yeah. <laughs> so something happened, you know, where we just didn't get the mic going. Well, Tim, but... it, it, it's absolutely, it, it's the thing. I thought I read my poem at least to be once on Rattle. Uh -huh. And then my mic doesn't work. It's just, <laughs> it's just unfair. Well, anyway, we got you, the... though. We have you here. So, uh, <laughs> so, what, so where are you calling from, first of all? I always like to ask. I'm calling from Peru. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. I'm in Lima. And um, and Dick is a poet friend of mine, and I admire him hugely. And every time, uh, and that book of his, the Ukrainian one, has floored me completely. But so thank you for tonight. I I I am learning a lot all the time, but from Dick, I have learned more than from many people. Yeah, he's definitely a great teacher, and you can tell uh, that he's been a teacher in the past too. Um. Let's see. So, so this is a question you wanted to read, right? Yeah, this is just appeared in Sheila Nagig the other day, and um, I thought because you wanted recent ones, mm -hmm. this is probably the most recent that's been published. Yeah, that's great. Let's hear it. Question in homage to Rainer Maria Rilke. 
Dear God, it was a biggish year, and still to come is much we would avoid. The structure once so dear to us is quite in tatters, is unraveling, falling around us with a tiny sigh like autumn leaves. The ground is harder than at other times. The seeds don't yield, work bears no fruit. It's all your fault or mine, or theirs, and she is definitely much to blame. We look around us and with pointed fingers find innocent wrongdoers. The hay is in, but it is wet and rotting. The corn sits empty on the stalks. Those who did not build by now may never have a house, and those who did build find it rubble. We don't do well, dear God, our world is out of sync. Although I never asked before, I do so now. Are you, and have you ever been, and do you care? Oh, beautiful poem. Thanks for so much for sharing that, Rose. It's, uh, Thank you. you know, those questions and great images and details, too, throughout the poem. Um, yeah, I'm so glad you could join us. Hope you join us again sometime soon. Thank you. Yep. That was a uh, Rosemary Bohm. Uh, you can find Rosemary at a uh, Rose hyphen Mary hyphen Bohm B O E H M hyphen poet dot com. Check that out or <laughs> Builderbohm dot blogspot dot com. We got the links on the bottom there, so we might as well. Well, share actually, them. there are two superfluous ones, and <laughs> I I have two emails, and I've taken them out of one, but I I'm not technically advanced enough to take <laughs> them out of the other one. Well, see, well, people can find it if they want. Thanks so much for joining us, Rose. It's great. Thank you. Okay, take care. Um, yeah, that was Rosemary Bohm with question from uh, Sheila Nagig's latest issue. Um, next up, let's go to Bishwajit Mishra. Hi, team. Hey, Bishwajit. How are you tonight? I don't know. I, I took you literally, and I didn't have anything, so whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but I did seven days. <laughs> I don't know what to call. Okay. Uh, it's called Aid Memoir. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? Because I don't. Oh, it's just adding uh, something to help remember. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Day one. Long becomes longer as grew up proceeds despite all efforts. Maybe my signature comes at the beginning. Lest someone leaves before the end, because what good is any without my stand? Still all is well that ends well, reinstated at the fall time. Day two, usual basking in the repatriating warmth, nuts and bolts, quit. Try to only work back to this. Day three, who does offer questionable order? Only are set in orbit. Sun stays long, I go on a rare winter walk. But tomorrow's lunch stays unsorted. Another day of falling back to the world. Effort, still effort. At least, lure of verses hang in, but no sound. Still like stuck in a limbo. Which one is the heaven? Travel or travel? Maybe just a number in the myriad of addictions. Uh, the biggest to be the best. Aha, that's a sarcastic word. From whom to find out should be a good start. A5, hard about writing a poem, unread books by the bed, yet another snake pen wrote itself. I was just a librarian providing books with the pride of no non owning lender, but went through high and low. Image writes itself, warm, soaked. In winter, a day loop. Day six, yes, enjoy food, but the little snow again. Day seven, a desert gets swathed by a spring breeze, coolness of the waves lapping up. Salinity is an irrelevant transparency when emotion sticks out the sand after the swash and looks for a charm that the heart. Fingers to a song. 
Ah, thanks for sharing that. I love that last one. The day seven, the the cool, the solidity it, is an irrelevant transparency. Point. Yeah, that's cool. That part was really, it, it disturbed me for three days. I, I saw a little girl uh -huh. and he has this, this developed degenerative kind of condition. Mm -hmm. I saw for the first time mm -hmm. and uh, it just bothered me. Yeah. That, that's the one. Those two last two days are those. Mm -hmm. Because she came with others and everybody liked it, but she didn't eat. Oh, yeah. So, mm. and that's, it snowed. Yeah, well, that's heartbreaking. So you hear the emotion in it that. It bothered me. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I wrote a poem about it. It is true. That's why it comes out probably. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks so much for sharing that, Bish. Would you, uh, it's a pleasure yeah, as always. You could, you could feel that in that poem toward the end. Thanks for sharing it. Very good night. Yep, you too. There's a Bishwishit Mishra, uh, once again with um, A.D. Mamor, I think you'd say. Um, okay. I, I'm very um, not bilingual or trilingual or any kind of lingual, unfortunately, <laughs> which makes me very sad. Um, let's go to Jennifer Gartner next. Hi. Hi, Tim. Hey, Angela. How you doing? Good. I send in the zombie trees. So. The zombie trees. Really interesting. Okay, the zombie tree poem. So, so tell us about this. What are zombie trees? <laughs> well, it, it's funny. Um, in California, uh, the Sierra Nevada mountains, they have these kind of trees and it, this forest of zombie trees, they call it, because pretty much where they live, they can't actually be there anymore because... Mm the climate and the ecosystem, they're not sustainable actually to live there. So they're just one like wildfire or drought away from being, you know, dead and completely dead. But mm -hmm. um, so they're saying they're living on borrowed time and even, you know, their little seeds that drop, you know, aren't surviving. And, you know, basically once all them once all they officially die they're just going to be replaced with these like little shrubs mm -hmm. so you know there's a concern about that because of the you know the changing environment so it's you know i'm when i saw it i thought it was kind of interesting that you know these these changes are happening and it's you know other people don't know about it though it, you know it's happening all you know it's happening mm -hmm. in this place but it could be happening in places we don't know of yeah it's really interesting i you know i'm, I'm at the foot end of the sierra nevada's kind of it's not technically but it's the same ecosystem or environment and i had never heard about it it does remind me of there's um a similar thing that's going on in the Carolinas on the coast that I read about where the ocean water is, is going farther inland. And so the trees that were typically there in the marshes can't live because of the, the water is too inundated with salt. And so there's a kind of, I don't know if they called it zombie forest or there's some kind of forest that they, they named it after, but it's like a dying because of the, the salt water that's, that's coming in. So very similar, you know, there's so many places where the environment's changing for the worse. That's for sure. Yeah. And I mean, and it's, it does have to do with the wildfires too, like, you know, kind of devastating things, but mm -hmm. it has to do with like just the ecosystem out there. And, you know, they're, they're kind of grandfathered in because they're there, but really they're kind of dead, mm -hmm. just kind of standing there. That's why yeah. they kind of call it the zombie. So yeah, okay. well, let's hear the poem. <laughs> the zombie trees lost equilibrium. They can't walk away. Their branches struggle to lift beneath the ground to reach out for a final drink. Dry arms crack in whipping winds. Rough edges of their mold-eaten bark with bug-infested trunks. The hollow dehydration of young seedlings strangled before bloom. The orange and red lashes of heat wait in tinderbox matches. The burn until the last tree stands. The hiker's foot catches on dead limbs. Oh, great. Yeah, great poem. And that could be me hiking through the woods. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for sharing that. I have to look into more of this. I wonder if it's happening anywhere in the forest where I am. Thanks for sharing that, Angela. Thank you, Tim. Yep. Have a great night. You too. Great job, Nick. Awesome. <laughs> I'm so happy. Uh, I, was I, got a ch I haven't been here in a while because I've been... It's been crazy in my life, but I'm like, I'm going to be here for Dick's thing. So I'm just very happy to see him. Oh, Yay! that's great. Yeah, so glad you could, Angela. That's great. <laughs> All right. Yep. Thanks. Have a great day. You too. Bye. 
It was Angela Gardner with uh, The Zombie Trees Lost Equilibrium. Uh, we have another first-time caller here. Richard Hag is here. And I think Richard was the, the poet that uh, Dick mentioned as a mentor who uh, helped teach him how to read poems. Are you there? Uh, I'm you? here. I'm here. Thank you. Yeah. It's thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, happy to be here. And I'm going to read a poem for Dick Westheimer. Oh, that is perfect. I love that. Uh, I'm a member of that uh, People's MFA group he, he spoke of. And uh, one of the uh, books that uh, we read when I joined earlier on was uh, Vislava Zimborka, Zimborska's Here. So that's one point in the poem. And then another point in the poem is uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the the words that have been uh, dropped from uh, a recent dictionary. Uh, and, and they are celebrated by Robert McFarlane in his book, The, the Lost Words. Mm -hmm. So two little background pieces yeah, so, cool. in return. He gave me the book of poems called Here. On its cover, the author, smiling, eyes closed, holds a cigarette in hand, coffee cup before her, books ranged all behind her, intensely local yet cosmic background of contentment. This book cost my friend, not her, just short of $15. To tell what it cost her is not possible, save to speculate about which poems took most life. All poems give and take life, what they breathe into and take out of us. In this book, every poem a lifetime of inspiration. I thought all afternoon, what equal could I give my poet gardener friend? Ten dozen cow plop pots, one heritage raspberry bush, a trowel, I could have it engraved by a jeweler. But then I thought of some of the lost words we'd spoken of, acorn, fern, willow, dandelion. For his garden of the lost then, seeds of oak, willow slips to start, Maiden's hair spores to scatter in shade, gray blonde seed heads like Einstein's mop puffed over a flat of black good dirt. And if I had the power of the woman on the cover, her word laden years, her capacious survival, I would conjure a yard full of his grandchildren, namers, little seers to say and sing them bring those lost words home a beautiful poem and, and great addition to the show having that for dick and we get to hear the uh the the voice in the in the poem that taught him how to read and he can hear it beautifully in the way you present that poem thanks so much for sharing that and joining richard oh uh, thanks glad to be here for dick yeah definitely well if you ever want to come back again feel free it'd be it's great to have you thank you yeah, thanks. That was Richard Haig uh, with a poem for Dick Westheimer. Perfect uh, way to round out the night. But we have some more open lines to go through still, too. Um, let's go. Uh, next up, let's go to Jennifer Elise Wang. Hey, hey, Tim. Hey, Jen. How you doing? I'm good. I enjoyed the, uh, the what is it, Sharon and blanking on who else used the haikus because it made me think of a project I did years ago uh, where I was taking a photo a day and then I decided to caption it with the haiku a day. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw up the link, but I, I sent in something a little bit more recent. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is beanie um, season, right? Is that what I have? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is my haiku that is published in Just Them and Dandy. It's a uh, queer zine focused on uh, fashion. Oh, cool. And so, yeah, beanie season came from a term that my friend, uh, my snowboarder friend used to describe fall when it's time to put on a beanie. <laughs> <laughs> so, the morning air bites at my knees as I skate around the park. The wheels flatten the fallen leaves even more, and I dodge a stray twig. After an hour of pushing, ollieing, and grinding, my arms feel smothered in the hoodie, but I don't want them exposed just like how I used to dread the wind hitting my neck and ears. Then the, then the dysphoria made me confront the cold head on. But thankfully, I have a secret weapon. When it's time to go home and the helmet comes off, 
I put on a beanie over my buzzed head and drew my mountains instead of the beach. Sleeves lengthen, shorts are traded for pants, but my hair stays short. <laughs> Great last line. Love that. Beanie season, uh, Jennifer. Thanks so much for sharing that. All right. Thank you. Yep. It was Jennifer Lee Swang with Beanie Season. And that's from uh, Just Femme and Dandy. Dot com, the website, which you can see on the screen earlier. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Jen. Always, I've never heard of that. Always interested in, in seeing new uh, new literary magazines. Um, next, let's see. Who do we have next? Mark, Gern, uh, Mark Grinier is next. Hi, Tim. Hey, Mark. How are uh, you tonight? I, pretty good. I, I tried your sequence, but I could only make five days. Well, that's okay. As uh, long here. as uh, you sat down, that's all that matters. And I focused on journal, so uh-huh. they're each dated. Spring sequence 2023. One, Monday, 327. Oh, by the way, each of these is a Tonka. Ah, gotcha. Okay. Okay. Monday, 327. The bird bath shelters a swarm of bees beneath its wet ceramic bowl. After months of rain, thousands seek sheltered places, new homes. Tuesday, 328, sunshine and blue skies, wildflowers breeze in the hills. Today, I've grown old, too old for flowerful slopes. I dream of walking through gold. Wednesday, 329, dawn's cold, wet, and gray. Day ends with sunshine, clear skies, and a birthday song. Imagined on a imaged on a phone, my graybeard son sings me free from rain. Thursday, three thirty, another day dawns cold and wet. We celebrate Paul's birthday again. That morning, many years gone, he cried in the brightest dawn. Friday, three thirty one, months in dusk, clouds drift by, scattering far from us. Winter's blown away. Old age remains, reminds me our time under sun grows short. Yeah, excellent talk of sequence. Yeah, it's fun following people through their week every uh, I, I like this prompt. It, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, thank Mark. Thank you. Yeah. I have a wonderful uh, interview with, uh, with Dick, by the way. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I knew it would be. He's fun to talk to. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, next, let's go to Brent Stauffer. Brent hasn't been on in a while. In fact, I was, I was wondering just the other day, where has Brent been? Hey, Brent. It's great to see you again. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing good. Can you hear me? I can. We hear you. We see you. And uh, uh, looking good. How's it going? Oh, it's, it's going great. I um, I moved from uh, Connecticut back to Alabama. Oh, really? And so uh-huh. things have been crazy for the past few weeks. But uh, uh, I wasn't going to miss Dick's appearance <laughs> on the show. That's so awesome. It's, it, I, feel like, I feel like he's a... A local boy done good or something. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, that's great. Um, but it's uh, so inspiring to, to 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 learn more about his life and everything, and and uh, his process, and it's uh, hear more poems. It's just been a, a great evening. It's really fun. Yeah, it definitely has. Uh, so I'm glad to have you back, though. It's, I've been missing you. So what do you have to share? Well, okay, now I get a little embarrassed because <laughs> the the poetry has been so strong. But you know, or you may remember that I like to wait till the very last minute to do things. Yeah, just like me. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, I waited until the last minute to even look at the prompt. So I quickly realized that um, I should have looked at it a week ago. Anyway, so what I tried to do was write in reverse and just try to remember stuff. <laughs> and um, I only got three days in before it was time for the show to start. I wasn't going to miss that. So it's I've only got three out of the seven so far, but um, m- maybe next week I'll I'll return with the rest of the week. We'll, well it's a start. We'll it's it's better than I had yesterday. <laughs> so. Okay. <yeah. laughs> okay, let's go. Okay, remembering a week. Monday, I got the assignment late. No way to do it right. So now the question is, why try? Won't do any good. Beckett snickers behind his hand. Camus coughs on some smoke. Sunday. The needle hovering over the blood red E. Never drove this truck on vapors before. 
sailing down the long, unlit airport roads like a lonely electron hurtling through dark, dendritic tunnels. I don't know where home is. Siri might die any time. Saturday. The little orange electric lawnmower choked angrily on the hidden black branch. An unseen sun still hammered his nails of heat through the sullen, swollen clouds. Later, the bright cold beer left in the mouth over the tongue to shower the inside of the body with a mystical coolness. <laughs> Great ending, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that, uh, that, that, that first taste of beer you have after mowing the grass mm-hmm. is always the very best. It definitely is. <laughs> I totally <laughs> agree. Yep. Yep. Well, thanks for sharing that, Brent. It's like, just a pleasure to see you again. Yeah, I hope you come back uh, more regularly now that you're settled down. I definitely will. Thanks, yep. thanks to everybody. Thanks for Dick. Yep. See okay. you. Thanks, Brent. Yeah. Is Brent Stoffer with remembering a week or at least a half week? Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's go next. We have a couple people left. Is it, um, I think Steve is here. Steve is not Stephen Croft, right? Steve's a different Steve. <laughs> hey, Steve, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I believe so. Can you hear me? I can. How's it going? Well, uh, it's going great. I, I'm having all kinds of problems with my computer. Everything is out of sync. Mm-hmm. Well, we have so, you here. Oh, okay. Uh, so I. This I is Steve a... Horrell, right? Yes. Yes. Ah, it perfect. Is. Okay. Yeah. Well, good. Great okay. to have you on. See, so, we don't have the video, but we have your sound perfect. So, uh, so what do you have that you want to share with us? Okay. So I sent you a poem. Did you get it? I did. Yep. George, right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is, it's not a prom poem. And the only reason I sent this poem in because at one point in an interview that you did, you said that um, if you don't see poems like you write, you should send it in. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is a this is a poem that my wife, when she was alive, said to me, "You can never read that in public." <laughs> I'm a little scared now. Okay, well, I've I read it. I've read it twice in public, uh-huh. and one, it did not go over well. Uh oh. And in the second one, where I read it up in a place called Dodge Cove, mm-hmm. which is a a um, it's up in the central coast of British Columbia. Across from Prince Rupert, it's a uh, a water access only little village with about twenty five people, um, and it went over great. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I'm may I read it now? Oh uh, yeah, go ahead. I'll put it up on screen. Go ahead, dive right in. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> our first day of the tree planting contract, loading our tree bags staring down at the steep gnarl of West Coast logging slash. A pickup slides to a stop, and the guy inside swearing at us, what the fuck are you doing hanging out on the side of the road? You're supposed to be fucking working. Momentary silence. Then at least we're not sitting in a pickup fucking the dog doing nothing. Satisfied, the pickup roars off, emitting a blue fart of smoke. That's George. Turns out I'm staying in the same Atco trailer. Drinker's camp. So that's how we establish cred. One night after opening a bottle of whiskey and throwing the cap away, George holds forth. Hey, you want to know something? I don't give a shit. Ah, uh, come on, George. No, I mean it. I don't give a shit for all this bullshit. New bedroom suites handmade and all, two fucking thousand dollar stereos. Oh, sure, it's nice. Makes the wife happy. But really, I don't give a good goddamn about anything too fucking much. George, you're a mechanic, eh? Heavy duty, donkey doctor. Well, yeah, sure. Sure, that's what I am. So fucking what? You give a shit about your fucking job, don't you? Well, for Christ's sake, I make 4500 a month pay... 20 fucking 200 in income tax. Yeah, I give a shit, but not a big fucking shit. This guy here, old Dingbat, the fucking super. So what's he think he is, a fucking detective? 
Got nothing better to do than snoop around in my pickup. Found a bottle he did behind the seat. Could be anybody's bottle. Just because it's in my pickup don't mean it's mine, right? Christ, Coke drives to work with me. Lots of people get in and out of that pickup. Could be anybody's bottle. And then he sniffs my thermos cup. Smells like whiskey. Well, that don't mean fuck all now, does it? Truck's not locked. Anybody can come in here and use my thermos cup. How the fuck am I supposed to know? Don't prove nothing, I said. And if you're so damn interested in sniffing around, why don't you go sniff all the panties down in the married quarters, for fuck's sake? That's what I told him. Now, nah, I don't give a shit about this job. Fuck it. I'll go somewhere else. Except I got some buddies here, eh? Ain't that right, Coke? You're fucking right, too. <laughs> Well, that was so great. That, yeah, you definitely was in, got the voice. That that was in a logging camp in what was then called Lyle Island in the Queen Charlotte's. Uh -huh. And of course, now it's called Atle Gwai in Haida Gwai. Oh, really interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, that's you definitely got the voice. It reminds me a lot of, um, you know, working those kind of jobs, all the characters that you uh, end up around <laughs> and get to meet. It's just, I kind of miss it, actually. You'd think that, like, poetry was full of really interesting, strange characters, but... But uh, blue collar type jobs sure beat poetry, I'd say, in that regard. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Steve. Okay, great. Thanks. Yep, thanks. Okay, bye bye. Bye. That was Steve Sorrell with uh, George. Interesting character sketch. Uh, so we have uh, Lucy Chow here, and then we then we go uh, back to Dick. Uh, Dick has hung out. He stayed awake despite um, maybe got some extra water. But uh, let's uh, let's talk to Lucy Chow first. Then we'll see what Dick had too. Hey, Lucy, you there. Hello, Tim. Yeah, thanks so much for joining again. How are you right, doing tonight? Uh, good. It's morning here in oh, that's right. cloudy, overcast morning. <laughs> uh -huh. but, um, the weather is having quite a bit of a mood swing these days. It's winter today and yeah, summer I, last week. I know. It's it's the same here. It's, uh, it has to be summer again next week. Yeah, we had the Crazy. snowstorm, and then we had... Some really nice days where we played Little League baseball and then uh, back to freezing when I was walking the dog today. So it's just that that time of the year, yeah. I guess, where everything seesaws. So what have you got for so, us? So um, 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 I got this assemblage of uh, the short poems I, that I wrote over, say, um, the last few months, mm -hmm. Be because um, this this is very interesting um, coincidence. Because uh, we have this um, um, short poems journal prompt next uh, last week, mm -hmm. but uh, actually before that, I have been doing this experiment of um, recording daily details, and so over a fairly long period of time, I gather of um, the ones that really mm, made their mark mm -hmm. in my memory and assembled, assembled this page. It's called Lively Flakes Falling Down My Page. Sounds great. Let's hear it. Grazing, leaves of grass, greenbacks. Dear nipping buds, nip the problem in the bud. Calming my hair, chirps curried from osiers, caress my ears. Cardinals beak, busy on cassock of stone Buddha. Sprinkler burbling like a darkling thrush's blithe throat. Incense of the day's last flames, purple passiflora. Night air ambrosial with almond blossoms, wagashi moon. Dawn, the blue altar is cold until it isn't. Pains of sunshine, unsalted butter, unsaltine. Out of my window, an alps of apple blows in alpenglow. 
Tea break. I drink pulsing azure from atria of air. Walking, my waving hand kissed by careless wings. Long fingers of rain wear thimbles of gravity. To Gerard Nelly Hawkins, where we trod on fallen leaves, earth is seared with their inscapes. Oh, very cool. Thanks so much for sharing all those, Lucy. It's a wonderful haiku sequence. And, uh, you know, as, as everybody knows, I like haiku a lot. So it's great to see so many haiku today. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, that was Lucy Chow uh, from China, where it's a uh, day, early morning, uh, sharing lively flakes down my page. Uh, it's a haiku sequence. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, next up, let's go to back to Dick Westheimer, who is stuck around, has a prop poem for us. Oh, actually, I have a PR poem. Oh, no, it's a PR poem. Okay. So, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. So so which PR poem and, and what do you want to... What do you want? To, how do you want to introduce called, it? I'll pull it up. It's the, called the Math of Thanatos, and it was in response to a number of stories this week that involved death, including the shooting and um, the thirty-eight, I think now, migrants who died in the migrant camp in Mexico fire um, the same week, which didn't quite make the headlines, but mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so. Um, as we said earlier, there just there's a lot, you know there's a, there's enough pain and agony to go around every there week. There definitely is. There's no shortage. Uh, so this this is the death of Thanatos, and Thanatos is the god of of death, basically, um, um, minor god, major god, depending on which which part of Greece you're talking about. So here we go, the math of Thanatos. Did you see him lurking? outside the school or down the street? Did you see him with his scratch pad taking names the way he always has from the time of Troy to the killing fields the, to the neighbor boy who gave it all up at the flowering end of a gun? Did you see his tally marks? Always one and one and one because even the God of death does not forget that each one has a name, that there is no six or 36 or six million. There is only this girl with the pink barrette, that boy with the missing tooth, Big Mike who cooked for his family of eight, Cindy, Kathy, Fernando, Jesus. Once I asked my rabbi how many weddings he blessed this year. He didn't know. Each one is one, he said. I did not ask the number of funerals. Here's what I'd know. When Thanatos makes his way to my home, he'll make a single slash in his book and call me by my name. Yeah, another poem with a great ending, Nick. And a bunch of people asked me about your endings during this show because um, you do have a way of, of sort of sticking the landing. And, um, and that's another poem that does that. Um, thanks for sharing it. Thanks, Tim. And th thanks for your hospitality. And I really appreciate it. Yeah, well, it's just my pleasure. I'm so glad to have you on. And it's so fun that you stuck around uh, you know, through the open lines and had an open lines poem, too. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Keep up. Yep. Talk to you soon. Yeah, awesome. Bye -bye. Thanks. Yep. Yep. Talk to you soon, Dick. Thanks a lot. That was a Dick Westheimer, of course, with uh, The Math of Thanatos rounding out the show. Um, and at a perfect time, too, because we're just up on time. Let me do the... Uh, the uh, Saiku really quickly. So the Saiku this week is based on this story, which I'll pull up. This is from, um, is it the University of New South Wales in Sydney? Yeah, yeah the University of New South Wales, Sydney. Um, right here is the story. Let me clear out the, the room so you can see it a little bit. This is um, Deep Ocean Currents Around Antarctica Headed for Collapse Study Finds. And so um, our Antarctic circulation could slow by more than 40% over the next three decades with significant implications for oceans and the climate. And um, it's really interesting. The ocean currents are really, really interesting to me uh, because, well, I don't know. It's probably too much to get into, but I've always wondered, for a long time I wondered, 
after watching Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth and all that kind of stuff, um, what what ends, what puts the brakes on warming so it doesn't run away? If, if warming waters release CO2 and CO2 is the control knob, every warming event would have been a runaway warming event. And so what puts the brakes on that? Turns out that it's these o- ocean circulation um, things. And so what happens is when the ocean circulation, when, when fresh meltwater goes into the ocean, um, it shuts down these salt-driven circulations, which then stop the heating from being transferred to the poles, which then the cold poles get cold. Sea ice forms on the poles because the water is more cold and there's a lot of fresh water on the surface that hadn't sunk. And then you get an increased albedo. And so that's the thing that usually regulates and keeps it from running away is the actual meltwater itself. So it's kind of troubling and interesting to see that these um, currents around Antarctica are shutting down too. So that was the science story that caught my eye this week. And somehow it evolved into this haiku. Um, I was going for thinking about about cold water swimming and ponds being thawed and stuff, but it ended up carving its way down into this haiku. So here we go, the haiku for the week. Breaking through the surface tension, fingertips. Breaking through the surface tension, fingertips. That is your haiku for the week, and that is the show for the week. Thanks, everybody, for joining. It's been really fun. It's so fun having Dick on, seeing him every week as we do already do, getting to know him better for the whole hour. Um, great poems on the open lines as well. Uh, next week's guest in the Rattlecast is going to... Well, let, me, let me show you the prompt first, I guess. Next week's prompt in the Rattlecast, inspired by Dick. I should do that before I do the guest. Um, you notice the first poem, the title poem, A Sword in Both Hands, has the word America repeated many times um, as a kind of refrain. And it, 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 there's a power that comes in using America over and over again in that poem of Dick's. So we're going to use that to inspire next week's prompt. And the prompt is pick a noun, either randomly or with intention, and write a poem that includes that noun in every line. So we're going to pick a word like America or like whatever you want and include that word in every line. So it becomes a refrain like that. See how long you can keep the poem going. That is your prompt for next week. And next week's guest in the Rattlecast is going to be um, Alexis Rowan Fancher. Uh, we've published Alexis many times over the years. A great L.A. poet and photographer, too. Um, she writes a lot of things that might make me blush, so we'll see how that goes. She has books of erotic poetry and things like that. Um, her newest book is Brazen from, and from New York Quarterly. Um, she's going to be the guest next week on Rattle Customer 189, Alexis Roan Fancher, Monday, April 10th, the regular time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you there. Hope you have a great week in the meantime, and I will talk to you later. Goodbye.